Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing Andromeda, Andromeda Galaxy, a galaxy that is actually visible from a lot of different places on the planet, and is even visible in locations with quite a lot of light pollution. Here's one of the recent images from the astronomy picture of the day. But despite being the closest large galaxy to us, it's still quite mysterious and still has a lot of unanswered questions about its formation and about certain features that have been discovered in this galaxy that even today are difficult to explain. We've discussed one of these features in one of the videos from about a year ago, you can find this video in the description below, but a lot of the mysteries of the Andromeda are actually right at its center, specifically in the region we usually refer to as a nucleus. And here, the Andromeda galaxy, unlike other galaxies we've explored before, first of all seems to have two different very visible cores, whose origin and whose nature is not really known to us, but on top of this has unusual features that resemble very bright stars around the core, orbiting around the center in a way that is kind of difficult to explain even today. Not to mention that there are also quite a lot of X-ray sources that suggest a lot of black holes and neutron stars, something that's not even visible inside the Milky Way's core. In other words, the Andromeda's core seems to be very different from the one in the Milky Way. But in many other ways, the galaxies are actually extremely similar to one another, even in terms of mass and in terms of size. As a matter of fact, the scientists sometimes refer to the Andromeda as a sister galaxy or as a twin galaxy of the Milky Way. But there's another feature that's a little bit different about the Andromeda that seems to suggest slightly different origins. In this case, we're talking about global clusters. The Andromeda galaxy seems to have way, way more. And so even though the Milky Way galaxy has approximately 150, the Andromeda seems to have over 450. And on top of this, it also seems to possess some of the most massive and some of the largest global clusters we've ever seen. And one of the reasons this is important is because global clusters are also associated with various previous galactic collisions because many of them came from various galaxies and many of them might have even been centers of various galaxies. And the biggest, most massive and most peculiar cluster discovered so far is the one you see right here known as Mayel 2 potentially possessing some kind of an intermediate mass black hole on the inside and also being at least twice as massive as the most massive of the Milky Way's clusters. It contains several million stars on the inside and is believed to have been some kind of a core of an ancient galaxy that the Andromeda destroyed. But it doesn't just have one of these, it actually has quite a few. And more importantly, because there are so many clusters in the Andromeda galaxy, it also suggests that it might have had a much more violent past and it might have absorbed a lot more galaxies in the process, possibly three times as many. On top of this, unlike the clusters in the Milky Way galaxy, which are relatively similar in terms of age, the clusters in the Andromeda do show a much wider range of ages, some of them being super super old, but some of them also being extremely young, just a few hundred million years old. And that kind of implies that some of them came from much younger galaxies and the Andromeda might have actually absorbed a lot of galaxies in the last few billions of years. And compared to the Milky Way galaxy that you see right here, that has a few dozen different dwarf galaxies orbiting around it, Andromeda also seems to have more partners, with some of them in very peculiar orbits, suggesting common origin. And more specifically, suggesting that all of them are probably going to have the same fate at some point in the future. And so, a few years ago, the scientists who were studying the Andromeda galaxy and its clusters discovered a few unusual signs around the Andromeda, suggesting that it might have eaten huge amounts of different galaxies in the past. Now, normally when studying galaxies, the scientists look for these so-called stellar streams that you see right here, that usually indicate that the galaxy used to exist here and has now been absorbed into the larger partner. In the last decade, quite a lot of these have been discovered around the Milky Way as well, and you can find out more about them in one of the videos in the description. But in comparison, the inner region of the Andromeda galaxy contains what's known as the Giant Stellar Stream, GSS, the largest such stream in the vicinity of our own galaxy, naturally suggesting some kind of a large galaxy or several galaxies being absorbed a few billion years ago. But this was discovered quite a while ago. Now, a few weeks ago, the scientists have discovered something else. Another intriguing sign pointing at a huge consumption of various galaxies in the history of Andromeda. They've discovered approximately a dozen different clusters, all of which seem to be connected gravitationally and also much older than everything else in the galaxy, with all orbiting in a similar pathway to a typical stream, suggesting either several galaxies being absorbed all at the same time 
or potentially a huge galaxy with several clusters on the inside being stretched and destroyed over a period of several hundred million years. But also suggesting that in this case, the Andromeda was actually growing and increasing in size in these really huge massive growth spurts, basically suddenly absorbing a lot of galaxies and a lot of mass all at once, and then potentially having nothing going on for a few billion years. In the process of naming this structure, the Dulay structure. A collection of globular clusters that actually also seems to be connected to the previously mentioned giant stream that seems to orbit around the Andromeda as well. And that's of course a pretty important evidence suggesting that a lot of the growth in the Andromeda galaxy at least was extremely violent and involved multiple really massive collisions with the Andromeda eventually becoming the winner. Although intriguingly enough because there are 20 different clusters in there it does suggest that it must have been maybe several galaxies, possibly smaller galaxies and possibly in the same orbit kind of similar to what the Andromeda currently has around it right now. In other words, the implication is that the Andromeda seems to consume galaxies kind of all at once, with all of this involving extremely active periods when the galaxy itself probably becomes extremely active and starts to consume and destroy smaller partners, leaving nothing but global clusters behind, with major signs of at least two such events happening in the past. The most recent one probably happened about 5 billion years ago, and much older one probably happened around 9 billion years ago. And both resulted in the sign that we see right now, the giant stream and the chain of various global clusters in a very specific orbit. But now there's a bit of a mystery, or really more of a question. Is this how the Milky Way has grown as well? Or was this something unique to the Andromeda and does it actually make it a kind of a special case? Now based on the orbits of its partners, the current potential answer seems to suggest the latter. The Andromeda might actually just be a little bit different from the Milky Way. At the moment, that particular part is unclear. But it's also even unclear what happened to the Andromeda. For example, the scientists actually want to find out if that Dewey structure is somehow related and possibly even directly connected to the previously mentioned giant stream. And if they are connected, it actually suggests that at some point in the past, the Andromeda must have swallowed a humongous galaxy. The galaxy that left all of these signs behind. And if so, Maybe this is where the second core is coming from. It's still not entirely clear what produces that second core, but if it's from a galaxy that was swallowed, it would make the Andromeda an extremely unique type of a galaxy, a binary core galaxy. Although at the moment, only one black hole has been discovered here, with the other region being something slightly different, something we discussed in one of the previous videos. That video should be in the description. But at least for now, that's really all the scientists have discovered. Yet another mystery of the Andromeda, and another discovery in regards to the origin of this unusual galaxy, this time involving globular clusters, and an unusual new structure, or a chain of structures, that we didn't really know existed until now. Here's roughly where it's located in comparison to the rest of the galaxy. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this new discovery and a new study that might help us resolve one of the older mysteries in regards to the formation of extremely massive black holes inside the objects known as quasars across the early universe. With the mystery here being pretty simple, how exactly did certain black holes become so extremely massive so early in the universe? Did they actually absorb a lot of mass? Did they collide with other black holes? Did something else entirely happen? Or maybe they existed from the beginning of the universe itself as the so-called primordial black holes? With some of these black holes becoming such giants that they would actually dwarf the black hole in the middle of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And that's only after a few hundreds of millions of years of existence when the universe was still in its infancy. So how exactly did they do it? Well, so this recent study is actually based on some of the older observations from the Hubble telescope and was able to find a very important missing link, a link regarding the objects we usually refer to as quasars. The objects that represent an extremely active galactic nucleus where the black hole is absorbing a lot of mass, spewing out a lot of energy, and as a result is producing extremely bright astrophysical jets visible from billions and billions of light years away from us. And in terms of quasar discoveries, there actually have been more and more mysteries in the last few years. One of the bigger mysteries is, once again, in regards to discovering these quasars at extremely far away distances. Just last year, the scientists found one 
at the time when the universe was only approximately 780 million years. And because we believe the galaxies only started forming around 400 million years after the beginning of the universe, it means that after approximately 380 million years, this was already an extremely powerful and super super massive object. Something that a lot of modern formation theories, usually using supercomputers, have actually a bit of a trouble explaining. How exactly did such an object form? And in terms of the actual distances from us, well, here we can use one of the online calculators, and I personally really like using this one by Ned Wright from UCLA to determine the distances to this object. That paper from last year determined that the redshift here was 6.82. So by plugging in this number right here, we can actually determine the distance to be approximately 28.5 billion light years from planet Earth. And that's of course relatively far. One of the farthest objects we've ever discovered, but naturally not the farthest, as a matter of fact, very recently we've talked about the most distant galaxy found so far. You can check that video out somewhere right there or in the description. But despite the excitement of discovering such an unusual object so far away, it actually created more mysteries and more problems for a lot of cosmologists. Mostly in terms of the ideas behind the formation of early galaxies and specifically the growth of black holes. When trying to calculate how such a massive black hole could form so early on, none of the modern theories could explain this very easily. And most of the modern theories usually revolved around the formation of starburst galaxies. Essentially, extremely active galaxies where a lot of different stars form at the same time and through the formation of stars and interaction of matter, they would often create very dense central regions where the massive black hole would then start absorbing a lot of mass and growing quite dramatically, quite fast. And so by absorbing huge amounts of mass very quickly, that's really the only way, or one of the few ways, the scientists could maybe explain the existence of these early quasars, with the other ways being a little bit less conventional, usually breaking the laws of physics or our current understanding of the universe. For example, maybe the universe is much, much, much older than we actually think. Or maybe these black holes existed even before the existence of the current universe. None of this has any proof though, so we can't really speculate that far. What we can do, however, is look for other examples of other galaxies that might be sort of an intermediary link. For example, by looking around at a lot of other galaxies, in theory it's possible to find various steps of evolution of a typical quasar. So maybe from being not a quasar, just a very massive starburst galaxy, to then becoming some kind of a dusty cloud where a lot of mass is being absorbed really quickly, to then finally becoming this extremely bright object with pretty much no gas around it that's visible from extremely far away distances and shoots out these very powerful astrophysical jets for possibly millions or even billions of years. And to be a little bit more exact, here the scientists expect this to be a kind of a three-step process. The first step is the formation of starburst galaxies. This is an example from one of the older studies of the discovery of one of the farthest galaxies ever found, GNZ11, located at a redshift of 11, which corresponds to about 32.1 billion light years away from us. And there's actually quite a handful of these discoveries from the early universe of these very, very ancient starburst galaxies. Normally they're not very difficult to see because they produce a huge amount of ultraviolet light corresponding to the formation of actual stars. And one of the more well-known examples from the nearby galaxies are the antenna galaxies you see right here. This is an image taken by Hubble a few years ago. And then something happens to these starburst galaxies making a lot of them form into quasars, which essentially shut down the star production for a pretty long time, usually until some other catastrophic event, such as a collision with another galaxy. Naturally, quite a lot of quasars have been also discovered in the last few years, mostly because they're so extremely easy to see because of the bright jets. And so a lot of modern theories predict that some kind of a supermassive black hole usually forms behind all of this dust and ends up being the center of the galaxy itself. But up until this point, there has never really been a link between this and this. In other words, the scientists didn't really understand how one transforms into another. Or actually, that's not entirely true. The understanding mostly came from simulations like this one, from the Illustrious project, but not really actual observations. And that's of course, once again, until now. We finally have the first ever missing link. 
a galaxy that seems to be in the process of forming a really, really massive black hole in the middle, but a galaxy that's also what's known as a starburst galaxy. Sort of visible right there as a red dot, right in the middle of the right picture. With the galaxy itself being part of millions and actually billions of other galaxies in this image from NASA. And what's interesting about this image is, well, the fact that it's always been there. It's actually been studied very thoroughly for many, many years. But it wasn't really until recently that the scientists finally discovered this. All of this is part of a very well-known image taken by Hubble, known as the Goods North Field. As you can see, there are so many different galaxies here already, and so many are well known. But obviously, some of them are kind of hiding in the plain sight. And some of them, like this tiny red dot you see right there, are just not really spectacular enough to notice right away until you study it further. Yet, this tiny dot turned out to be pretty important. So what exactly is this? This is an object the scientists refer to as GNZ7Q. The first ever rapidly growing black hole inside what seems to be a starburst galaxy. But more importantly, this missing link seems to be an exact match with a lot of predicted theories and a lot of computer simulations. A link that definitively explains to us how certain really massive black holes could have formed so early in the universe. Representing a kind of a precursor to a typical quasar, and representing a galaxy forming stars at a rate of about 1600 solar masses per year. Which is actually quite a lot, it's one of the most productive galaxies seen so far. Which is also why it appears so bright in the ultraviolet emissions, but interestingly is extremely faint in the X-ray emissions. Which suggests that there is some kind of a black hole here, but a lot of the emissions from this black hole are actually hidden by the dusty core around the disk. And one of the main reasons why this galaxy was even found is because of these multi-wavelength observations. When the scientists were reanalyzing this image, they realized that there was this one spot in the middle that just didn't really add up. The emissions here were just a little bit different from a typical starburst galaxy, and definitely different from a typical quasar. And with the current value of its redshift, it's estimated to be about 29 billion light years away from us. So sort of around that point in the early universe, where we do expect a lot of these starburst galaxies to start transforming into quasars. And all of this, right now, theoretically at least, adds up perfectly. It's obviously not something the scientists expected to find in this image, but it nevertheless makes a lot of sense. As in, it provides evidence for the current theories of formation of different galaxies and massive black holes. No unusual explanations needed anymore, because of the discovery of this beautiful galaxy that you see right there. And as the next step, the scientists are hoping to now use a similar technique on similar images, including of course this image, to try to find more of these unusual galaxies and to possibly clarify our ideas even more, determining how all of this transforms from one object to another and helping us understand how massive black holes grow. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries and simulations in regards to various extremely large structures in the universe. Specifically structures like the Laniakea, where we are located, things like the famous Great Attractor, the mysterious structure everything seems to be headed toward, and a lot of other formations that have been discovered in the last few decades that we're still trying to learn quite a lot about. But this recent study and the selection of videos included with the study help us understand how everything evolved in the last 12 to maybe 13 billion years and also help us understand where all of this will be headed in the next 20 billion years. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, but let's actually start with the idea of the scale of things here. Because here we really are talking about something extremely grandiose, something that's somewhat difficult to imagine for the human mind. I mean, for example, if we were to start escaping planet Earth and start to move faster and faster, we'll eventually reach the outskirts of the solar system. But moving at this velocity, it will take us a really long time to get where we're going. We now have to accelerate even more to try to escape the galaxy. And even here, we're still not even close to, once again, our destination. We have to keep moving and moving until we start seeing the collection of galaxies and various nearby and distant galactic clusters. And at some point, once we reach the distance of about 350 million light years away from us, 
that's basically where we have to start. We are now looking at different galaxies and specifically various galactic clusters that make up Linea Kea. The superstructure that we are part of. This was discussed in one of the older videos on the channel that should be somewhere right there or in the description, but in a nutshell, it's basically a lot of galaxies, something like 100,000 galaxies, all connected to one another gravitationally and currently moving in a relatively similar fashion. They're not moving in the same direction, but they are sort of connected. But in the last few years, scientists have also discovered that this is only temporarily. As a matter of fact, within the next few billion years, the Laniakea cluster, because of the interaction from the dark energy, is actually going to fall apart and form smaller structures. But despite of this, it's still the biggest structure where we're currently located, made out of several superclusters you see in this particular map right here. And we generally know that things here are always in motion and are always moving. But because of the scale of things, it's practically impossible to detect this in real time. Which generally is how universe works. Small things generally move really fast and generally live in their own time scale. Large massive things move really slow and also have their own scale as well. Nevertheless, because of various observations in the last few decades, the scientists have been slowly making a kind of a map of everything around us, mostly focusing on the motion of various clusters in the night skies and trying to figure out where everything was sort of going with several recent studies being able to create a three-dimensional image out of the 2D map that we currently have. With this recent study specifically focusing on various galactic clusters, around 10,000 of them as a matter of fact, and everything that's within about 350 million light years away from us. But here they really just focused on the motion and the evolution of various objects in the vicinity. They focused on several objects, but essentially here they just tracked the motion across the night skies in the last few billion years, but also trying to project it into the future. As a matter of fact, the simulation itself that you can find in the description below starts at roughly around 11.5 billion years ago when the universe was only 1.5 billion years old, with the simulation then showing us how all of this moved for about 11.5 billion years. But here they also introduced the idea of the dark energy, or essentially galaxies moving farther and farther away from one another, and also the idea of dark matter, and the idea of various galactic clusters that tend to chunk together. And so even though at first a lot of these galaxies were more or less equally distributed, over time because of the gravitational interactions, they tend to follow the regions of higher density and then essentially form larger structures this way. And that's how these clusters form things like filaments, and that's how essentially voids form, basically the space or the low density space between the galactic clusters, but more importantly that's how our home Laniakea was formed. With this part right here being Laniakea itself, and by definition this particular tremendously large structure is defined as a lot of galactic clusters moving toward some kind of a central point. In this case we refer to this point as the Great Attractor. A mysterious structure, a mysterious structure with a mysterious name and mysterious origins behind it. And this Hubble image kind of shows us where this particular attractor is. And if we were to look at the more familiar map of the Milky Way, it's kind of somewhere right here. And by definition, this is the core of Laniakea supercluster, but it's also extremely difficult to study because of its location, where as you can see from this image, it's kind of hidden by the galactic plane of our own galaxy. It's essentially in what we sometimes refer to as the zone of avoidance. The tremendously thick layer of gas that's formed by the galaxy itself that kind of blocks a lot of the things behind the galaxy. And because the attractor is somewhere right here, it becomes extremely difficult to figure out what exactly it is. Nevertheless, it seems to be there based on the observations of all of the nearby clusters sort of headed that way. With this simulation of a Laniakea supercluster showing us how the motion sort of looks like. So you can kind of see that a lot of the arrows are sort of headed this way somewhere. And that sort of represents this unusual gravitational attraction that many clusters headed toward. Nobody obviously knows what it is, but it's very massive. Its mass is several million times higher than the mass of our own galaxy, and it seems to have an effect that stretches across millions of light years. A lot of the galaxies and clusters moving toward this point are showing redshift changes of nearly 700 kilometers per second, which means that this is a very powerful, extremely massive 
whatever. We don't really know what it is. It, it's probably not just a single structure. It's probably a concentration of mass, possibly even a really large concentration of mass. But either way, it's currently unknown exactly what it represents and exactly what it's made out of. Which is why it's normally just referred to as a gravitational anomaly or the great attractor anomaly. With the supercluster known as Vela supercluster very likely being the point closest to the center of this anomaly. But on top of this, the scientists in the study decided to investigate several other structures. For example, they also took a look at an extremely large structure, the structure that you can kind of see right here, sometimes referred to as the Great Wall, one of the larger superstructures in the universe. In this case, once again showing where things are moving and how a lot of the mass seems to be congregating toward a central point, in this particular case uh, near the Coma Cluster. The cluster that became famous because of the unusual observations of tremendously large amounts of dark matter on the inside, and just overall being one of the largest galactic structures in the vicinity. This beautiful NASA image sort of shows us what all of this looks like. And then they also focused on the other structure, sometimes referred to as the Perseus Pisces filament. The part that you see right there on the right, next to the Leniakea supercluster. And this here is one of the largest known structures in the entire universe. At a distance of 250 million light years away from us, this is once again a structure made out of galactic clusters. But in this case, it also seems to be extremely dense and highly concentrated in many different types of galaxies. With many of these clusters and many of these galaxies once again moving towards some sort of a central region. But because on the grander scale of things, the dark energy is still the dominant force here, once we start looking into the motion of the galaxies into the future, things start to move apart a lot more, and a lot of the previous structures become non-existent. So things like Laniakea are going to fall apart, forming much smaller, much more compact structures, which will then fall apart later on as well. Here's one of the examples of one of the smaller galactic structures that's most likely going to form in the next few 10 billion years. Here's another really good example from the Great Attractor region, or specifically where we think it's located. In this case, it kind of shows us where everything is going to be moving for the next 10 or so billion years, and how everything is going to evolve over time. So this is essentially 10 billion years from now. And even though it doesn't look that different, in this case, a lot of the clusters do become a lot more concentrated, and a lot of the things that were not as gravitationally connected before eventually fly away from us and, because of the expansion of the universe, become invisible over time. And so overall, this is a pretty interesting study and extremely interesting simulations, sort of showing us how many of these grandiose structures are going to be evolving over time. But I guess more importantly, possibly answering some of the questions in regards to what's happening with a lot of these gravitational anomalies. Now, we still don't really have exact answers, but because of we are now able to form much better 3D maps and understand where things are headed, it becomes slightly easier to figure out exactly what's forming all of this and where everything is headed or where it's going to be headed in the next few billions of years. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the recent discoveries in regards to these jets that you see right here behind me, the objects we usually refer to as astrophysical jets, a phenomenon that seems to form around various objects in the universe, including stars, including galaxies, and including neutron stars like the one you see right here, with one of the more iconic ones being this one from the galaxy M87, the galaxy that became famous for its black hole right in the center. Although galaxies like Centaurus A that you see right here represent some of the biggest objects in the night skies as seen from planet Earth. We actually discussed this in one of the previous videos you can find in the description. But in this particular video we're going to be talking about the new discoveries and specifically about discoveries of some of the farthest radio jets ever found and some of the longest ones discovered to date which in the process allowed the scientists to discover something else about the formation of these jets, comparing them to, well, actually, another type of a jet, the type we usually find around airplanes. So the actual effects and the actual formation of the jets in this case seems to be kind of similar. And so first, let's start with that biggest jet discovered so far. It's actually from a relatively well-known galaxy, approximately 93 million light years away from us, known as NGC 2663. In this case, the center of this galaxy 
seems to contain an active galactic nucleus. Which basically means that the central black hole is active and is currently absorbing a lot of mass, producing a lot of energy in the process. Now some of the first images of this galaxy presented it as this. Nothing unusual going on here. But very recently the scientists behind this study right here that used one of the Australian radio telescopes to look at it, discovered that it seems to contain another object that's about 50 times larger than the galaxy itself. The object in this case is the jet. So if you were to compare this to the iconic Centaurus A, where the jets are relatively small in comparison, the jets from NGC 2663 are at least 50 times larger than the galaxy. You can see the galaxy as a bright point in the middle, and they seem to be at least a million light years across, shooting out material at almost the speed of light with huge amounts of energy. And so there's a tremendous amount of activity and huge amounts of power inside of this galaxy. The galaxy that seems to possess at least 10 times more stars than the Milky Way and resembles something that you see right here, a type of an elliptical galaxy that can also be referred to as an active galactic radio galaxy. But I guess more importantly, if this was visible to us using our own eyes, it would actually be bigger in size than the full moon. And that's at a distance of 93 million light years away from us. But because we don't see radio frequencies with our eyes, it's obviously invisible to us. But there's actually something else really important that was discovered from this particular study. The scientists discovered that the matter between galaxies, the intergalactic gas, seems to push back at the jets, which creates the shock diamonds that you see in this image. And it seems to resemble what we usually see around airplane jets as well. In the case of the airplane jet, as the material is being ejected at very high velocities, planet's atmosphere pushes back on the exhaust plume, which causes the jet to expand and contract creating the shock diamonds that you see. And that's pretty much what the scientists observe coming from the black hole in this galaxy as well. As the material moves along the jet, it's being compressed in certain parts which makes them glow more brightly, making them glow even more as the jet slams into the denser regions of gas. Which of course implies that there is quite a lot of intergalactic matter in the vicinity of this particular galaxy. And this is something that's been observed around other galaxies from other jets as well. As a matter of fact, it's even seen in the iconic Centaurus A. But naturally, never really in these particular proportions, because this is one of the biggest discovered so far. Not the biggest, but definitely the biggest in terms of the size in the night skies. As I mentioned, it's bigger than the full moon. Although if you'd like to learn more about the biggest jet discovered ever, check out one of the previous videos in the description. But as we know today, these particular jets and the effects produced by these black holes are pretty much ubiquitous. They seem to be everywhere in the universe. We don't obviously always see them though, because it's really always about the perspective from which we're seeing all of this. Now for example, we're able to see the jets in the Centaurus A because it's relatively close to us. And we're able to see these ones because they're very, very large. But in order to see some of the biggest radio jets out there, we actually have to be kind of lucky. The arrangement and the orientation has to be just perfect. And so that's pretty much what has been recently discovered in one of the other studies in regards to one of the most distant radio quasars ever found, possibly even the farthest discovered to date. It's definitely the most distant radio source found so far, and is actually sending light to us from when the universe was only about 700 million years old. In other words, the light here took 13 billion years to reach us. In terms of the actual distances, it's about 28.7 billion light years away from us. And so this seems to be the farthest radio signal ever found, and it's really because of the extreme power of this particular galaxy, and very likely extremely long and very powerful jet, like the one I just showed you. But in this case, instead of being sideways, it seems to be almost directly pointed at us. And here's the image produced by the scientists. It doesn't really show us much, except for an extremely bright radio spot right in the middle that seems to be kind of stretched because it's not perfectly aligned. But just like with the iconic image of M87 black hole, it's important to understand that this is a false color image. We're not really seeing the light here. The yellow and the orange here is simply radio light that was converted to the colors we can see. And so that's very similar here. Not the actual light, just the radio light. With all this being a result of a very massive black hole, at least 300 million solar masses, that's consuming the gas extremely fast. As a matter of fact, it seems to absorb the mass at the highest rate seen so far, which ends up producing approximately 600 times more luminosity compared to the Milky Way galaxy. But what's interesting is that it seems to be only happening now. 
And I'm saying now because when compared to the data from approximately 20 years ago, the discovery was that it seems to have lost some of the radioluminosity in the last few years. Which of course implies that it was very likely much brighter and much more powerful and absorbed even more mass just 20 years prior. But because this galaxy is also surrounded by a very large bubble of ionized gas, it essentially amplifies the radio frequencies, creating the unusual elongated shape with a lot of protrusions. And so a lot of the data coming from this quasar and coming from these radio emissions can actually help the scientists to directly analyze and to even map some of the early gas in the early universe because a lot of these radio emissions are going to be passing through this gas. But I guess more surprisingly, when studying this, completely by accident, the scientists discovered another radio source that you can kind of see on the right. They don't really know what it is yet, or even how far away it is, but it seems to be another radio quasar which are not particularly common in the early universe. And this one could even be farther away. Although if they are actually close together, and if this is some kind of a formation of early galaxies, that would be a pretty remarkable discovery. Mostly because the scientists have actually been trying to find examples of these early galactic clusters in order to understand how early galaxies came together and how they created the cosmic web, eventually forming the universe we know today. And so discovering these very powerful jets, specifically the ones producing radio frequencies that tend to pass through a lot of gas, can definitively help the scientists analyze the early universe, helping them understand how everything evolved over the past 13.8 billion years. And so because of the very powerful radio telescopes in Australia and South Africa and a few other countries that started operating in the last decade or so, we're now getting more and more data helping the scientists uncover new mysteries and resolve a lot of old questions but also uncover things we've never seen before, like this, or the jets in NGC 2663. Although I'm sure more and more radio discoveries are going to be made in the next few years. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a very strange discovery made by citizen scientists of essentially one of the strangest galactic jets we've ever discovered. Although not this one, this is just a video to illustrate what we're talking about. It was actually a jet that does something like this. It was literally striking another galaxy in a very strange and unusual way we've never seen before, with the actual image looking like this. But what's really intriguing about this jet is that it seems to be one-sided. It's really only coming out of one direction from this other galaxy, striking a neighboring galaxy and also producing unusual effects that nobody expected or actually quite the opposite, not producing the effects that were expected. And so in this video I wanted to talk about what the scientists found here, what we already know about the jets so far, and what this means for our understanding of various galactic formations and galactic evolution as a whole. But I also wanted to briefly mention some of the previous ideas on this topic from the last year or so, with many videos that you can find in the description below. And so first of all, we know that many different galaxies will often have these astrophysical jets coming from the center of those galaxies with very powerful black holes producing the jets, usually in opposite directions. The actual process of creation of those jets is still not entirely understood, but the scientists believe it has something to do with the magnetic fields of the accretion disk and possibly the black hole itself, expelling all sorts of matter in two different directions as they follow the magnetic lines. Now this particular jet is really exciting because technically you can see this from planet Earth. As a matter of fact, it would sort of appear this way compared to our own moon. It would be ginormous if we could see the radio waves. Because unlike in optical light, where this galaxy is barely visible, if you were to see this in the radio waves, you would actually see this huge formation in the night skies that resembles something like this. And you might already know what this is. This is quite an iconic shape. A galaxy we've discussed many times on the channel before, a galaxy that has been studied many times as well, Centaurus A. The galaxy that allowed the scientists to learn so much about the astrophysical jets in the last few years. With the other galaxy that's often used to study these jets being the iconic M87. With the jet being much longer and much more powerful, and also sort of pointed toward us, and so in reality it actually appears to travel approximately 5 times faster than the speed of light. It's not though, it's not really traveling that fast, it's a type of a visual illusion that's often referred to as superluminal motion. I believe there's a video about that as well, should be in the description. And so these two jets have been studied quite actively in order to discover what exactly happens to the galaxies when these jets are produced, but more importantly, how they're produced and what effects they might have on the neighborhood as well. But in the last few years, quite a few new mysteries have been discovered about the jets, 
with some still being unanswered even today. Mostly because we actually still have no idea exactly how they form and exactly what effects they have on the galaxy where they're produced, but also on anything near them. Now, back in 2013, the very famous digital sky survey known as SDSS collected a lot of data from various points in the universe, identifying several unusual galaxies. Some of them have already been discussed many years ago, but some of them were not really known until relatively recently. And because some of these galaxies were kind of unusual, the scientists wanted to follow this up by using other telescopes as well. For this particular study, the Indian scientists used the giant meter wave radio telescope, GMRT, located in India. But the scientists themselves didn't really do much because the actual processing and the actual detection was done by citizen scientists through the program known as RED at Home, the first Indian citizen science program. The link for this is also in the description below. And it's really intriguing because in the past few years, a lot of really exciting discoveries and some super strange discoveries have always been made by citizen scientists, I guess mostly because many of us have so much free time on our hands and we just want to find something really cool. I mean, one famous example would be the Boyajian star we discussed many years ago, the star that was producing strange and unusual dimming effects that even today remain kind of unexplained. And so in this case, by looking at various galaxies, they did find something that was kind of strange. They found a very powerful jet coming out of one of the galaxies that was actually hitting its partner that seems to be colliding with this galaxy, but for some reason all of this was only in one direction, with the opposite side missing completely. With this simulation right here sort of showing us what they believe is happening here. So there are these two galaxies not so far away from one another, they seem to be colliding, but one of them is producing the jet in one direction, literally just striking its partner with the actual jet then forming these unusual patterns, but also reacting with the gas in the partner galaxy and clearly causing some sort of an effect on the star formation and very likely gas formation in that colliding partner. Now normally, when it comes to these massive jets, today the scientists believe they produce several effects. One of these effects is called quenching. This is essentially when something stops the star formation in various galaxies, and one of them is called positive feedback, which basically means that it encourages star formation. Now, the quenching effects usually happen because these jets can heat up the gas dramatically, preventing any star formation from occurring, or even completely dispersing some of the gas from within the galaxy. Whereas the positive feedback usually happens when the jet can somehow concentrate the gas in a certain galaxy to one point or another, and then force some of the stars to form in those regions. But when exactly these events occur is not clear. Moreover, when it comes to various galaxies, we know that typically in a spiral galaxy, such as this one right here, the Pinwheel Galaxy, we're going to find quite a lot of star formation, which is usually visible as brighter blue light. In contrast, an elliptical galaxy, especially the giant one, will very rarely have any star formation at all. Or at least the star formation is going to be extremely slow, with most stars here being very old, which is usually why they're kind of yellow in color. Most of these stars are pretty old red dwarfs and various stars like our sun. And nobody really knows at the moment, or at least nobody is certain, why elliptical galaxies usually produce so few stars, whereas irregular galaxies or spiral galaxies will often produce quite a lot. But various massive black holes in the center of those galaxies, and of course the jets that they often produce, could actually provide some of the answers. The emissions that they generate could be actually responsible for extinguishing star production in various galaxies. And two common ways for galaxies to lose their star formation ability is either through what sometimes is referred to as a galactic tsunami that essentially launches huge amounts of very hot gas through the whole galaxy, slowly extinguishing star formation in the entire region, something that over time might expel pretty much all of the gas from any galaxy if it happens for millions and millions of years, but the other way is obviously through these astrophysical jets, either by ejecting some of the mass from the galaxy, or, as you see right here, by striking certain parts of the galaxy and thus extinguishing star formation that way, with this pair of galaxies potentially being the best example of this in action. These two galaxies right now are known as Red 12 and Red 12b, although in this case the plasma that creates all of this seems to actually extend even further, creating a kind of a mushroom shape with the image right here providing a little bit more detail. And this whole structure is actually really large. It's about four times as big as the Milky Way, nearly 500,000 light years long, and also much bigger than the host galaxy as well. But even here, the observation is very different from what the scientists expect. 
Knowing what the scientists know about the feedback mechanism from these astrophysical jets, we expect it to either extinguish stars or potentially cause certain regions to have more star formation because of the increase in pressure. But in this case, what we're seeing is some kind of an unusual symmetrical reflection where basically the jet seems to bounce back away from the galaxy, a galaxy that the scientists believe is not really gas rich and potentially doesn't even have enough gas to form new stars, but produces no positive feedback and seems to not encourage any star formation, leaving that partner galaxy pretty much as quiet as before. Or I guess in other words, it kind of seems to have no effect. It's as if the jet just bounced back, doing nothing. Now the scientists right now are not entirely certain why it seems to have no effect, and why the partner galaxy seems to be almost completely unaffected by it, but it might be somehow related to the recent video about the Magellanic Cloud Shield that was recently found around the nearby Magellanic Clouds, and actually a lot of other galaxies, with these corona potentially providing some defense from situations like this. So it's actually quite possible that it's the corona around the smaller galaxy that protected it from the effects of this unusual jet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries in regards to what the scientists refer to as a kind of a protective shield that seems to surround the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, preventing the Milky Way galaxy from stealing some of their gas and preventing them from falling apart completely as they interact with the Milky Way galaxy. Something that the scientists refer to as a Magellanic Corona because it surrounds two of the galaxies, the small Magellanic Cloud and the large Magellanic Cloud that you can sort of see right there in the top left corner orbiting around the Milky Way. And so in this case, the scientists are actually solving one of the older mysteries that help the scientists understand how certain galaxies evolve and more importantly, discovering and confirming a very important feature of various galaxies that allows them to maintain their shape and allows them to continuously create new stars. With all of this described in more detail in a paper that as always you can find in the description below. But I guess let's discuss the problem first and try to identify why this was a problem for a very long time. And actually a good example here is the galaxy we've discussed relatively recently, the relatively massive and somewhat influential dwarf galaxy known as Sagittarius Dwarf. A galaxy that orbited the Milky Way several times now, and with every single passage, influenced our galaxy quite dramatically, producing various ripples, and also increasing the star formation during several periods of the existence of the Milky Way. You can find more about this in some of the older videos. With the galaxy itself now being barely visible. As a matter of fact, you can actually see all three galaxies in this image, and of all three galaxies, Sagittarius Dwarf, despite its relatively huge mass in the past, is practically invisible from all of the background dust visible in the Milky Way. And that is actually not unusual. We kind of expect this to happen to most dwarf galaxies as they orbit around a larger partner, in this case the Milky Way. They sort of get shredded apart, they create what's known as the stellar streams, many of which have already been discovered and represent the remnants from various other galaxies, very likely absorbed by the Milky Way over the past 13 billion years. The typical progression for a dwarf galaxy. But sometimes scientists discovered dwarf galaxies that weren't just not disturbed by anything or were barely disturbed, but were actually surprisingly in one piece and were even able to produce stars. And that's actually a pretty big deal, because star production requires a huge deposit of gas and quite a lot of very specific interactions for all of this gas to then start to coalesce, producing star forming regions. And normally by orbiting a larger galaxy such as the Milky Way, a lot of the gas is stripped from various dwarf galaxies and is left behind as various stellar streams visible across the night skies. This obviously prevents the star formation from happening inside the dwarf galaxies, as becomes pretty obvious by looking at Sagittarius Dwarf. It wasn't even clear that this was a galaxy, mostly because no new stars here are produced, or at least not a lot new stars, and for the most part this is just various remnants billions of years old. But interestingly enough, the similar streams do exist around the Magellanic Cloud galaxies as well. As a matter of fact, they are actually pretty clearly visible in this image right here. This is a collection of various stars and various gas. And so clearly these galaxies are also losing a lot of their mass and are slowly being stripped apart by the Milky Way. We've discussed this in one of the older videos you can also find in the description. But this is I guess where the mystery kind of starts. We see the streams, we see the interaction, but we also see ridiculously powerful regions such as the Tarantula Nebula that produce huge amounts of stars. As a matter of fact, this is the most active star forming region in the nearby galactic space. And that implies that there is quite a lot of molecular gas here 
and quite a lot of it is still being delivered to the galaxy to produce even more very powerful, very massive stars. This particular region has even been compared to some of the earliest regions in the existence of the early universe that doesn't actually exist anywhere else in the nearby galactic space. But this is a dwarf galaxy that's being actively stripped by the Milky Way, so why exactly is this gas even there? The small Magellanic Cloud, as you can see in this image, also possesses some of these regions. And so this is a bit of a puzzle. How can these dwarf galaxies remain relatively whole and even have ongoing star formation with quite a lot of molecular gas on the inside. How exactly are these galaxies capable of forming new stars? Well, a few years ago, the scientists tried to theoretically explain this by suggesting that a lot of galaxies, and probably all galaxies, will usually have some kind of an envelope or a kind of a gas cocoon which acts as a defensive shield against the interaction with other galaxies or other types of mass. Or in other words, there should be some kind of a really large cloud of gas around these galaxies very likely formed by a lot of really hot supercharged gas, with the gas itself functioning very similar to a shield. A shield that's made of primordial cloud of gas, representing the remnants that served as the gas that formed the galaxy itself. And so anything else that tries to enter or pass through the galaxy will actually have to go through the shield first, with the shield then absorbing some of the impact, preventing these galaxies from falling apart or preventing them from losing more mass or more gas but also representing the first gas that would probably be stolen from these galaxies as they start to interact with more massive partners. Or at least that was the theory based on some of the modeling and some of the initial explanations, especially some of the very unusual observations from some of the more distant galaxies where these unusual cocoons or these shields have already been seen. At least to some extent. And if it wasn't for this shield, there would be really no way to explain how the Large Magellanic and Small Magellanic Clouds are able to maintain their shapes and can still produce stars. And the preliminary calculations did suggest that both galaxies were massive enough to actually host relatively large shields that would protect them from the interaction with the Milky Way for at least some time. But naturally, all of this was just a theory, a simulation, a calculation, but not physically proven. I guess until now. Because as the title of this paper suggests, the shield or the corona was finally observed. And observed using a relatively brilliant technique that in the past allowed the scientists to look at some of the more invisible things in the universe. But how did they do this? Well, they actually used quasars, super powerful galactic objects very very far away that emit light coming from everywhere in the universe, naturally created by very powerful black holes really far away from us, but whose light as it goes through various types of objects or gas changes just a little bit, allowing the scientists to then figure out what it passed through and even mapping certain things that would be otherwise invisible. Or, as you can see in this image, as these quasars start to emit light and as it passes through the relatively difficult to see shield, some of the ultraviolet light coming from these quasars ended up being slightly obscured and changed by the gas that it passed through, creating very specific patterns that would then be visible by some of the more powerful telescopes on the planet. In this case, the FUSE telescope, Far Ultraviolet Spectroscopic Explorer, that was actually retired a few years ago, but whose data is still available, and of course the iconic Hubble telescope that's able to create extremely detailed UV images. In the process of discovering that the corona seems to stretch for approximately 100,000 light years and actually covers a pretty large portion of the southern sky. But because it's also relatively difficult to detect, there's practically no way to see it unless you use an extremely powerful UV telescope. But if we could see it, it would probably be just as large as the Milky Way itself, if not larger. But this is obviously not the first time this technique was used, and as a matter of fact, just a few years ago, the scientists created this beautiful image that shows us the incredibly large halo or corona located around the nearby Andromeda galaxy, with the dots in this case once again representing various quasars. Here's what all this would look like for the Andromeda if we could actually see it. And so the technique itself is pretty brilliant. It actually looks at various types of silicon, carbon, and oxygen atoms that interact with some of the quasar light, leaving behind a very specific signature that's then used to create an overall map. But in this case, because it's very diffuse and also much smaller than the Andromeda Galaxy Corona, it was extremely difficult to produce this and required nearly 30 years of data of various UV observations. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing an idea of intergalactic light, or actually more specifically, intergalactic stars. Stars hiding between galaxies, 
that are generally extremely difficult to see and extremely difficult to find. Because, obviously, these stars, even though there are quite a lot of them, overall produce barely any light, with most of this light eventually becoming practically invisible because of much brighter objects nearby. And there are two main reasons I wanted to discuss this. One of them was a new study, and as always you can find in the description below, that has now officially discovered a completely new way to remove some of the more bright light and basically leave only intergalactic light behind, thus allowing us to discover some of these stars we were never able to see before. With the second reason being this beautiful image released by Hubble only a few days ago. The image of the galactic triplet known as the Wild Triplet, also known as R248. And in this case, this image directly shows us how many of these stars are formed, or essentially how intergalactic light is created, and why a lot of these intergalactic stars are very likely all over the place. A lot of these stars are very likely a result of various galactic collisions over time, or potentially a lot of other events that strip some of these stars from these galaxies, leaving them orbiting around the major galaxy, or essentially in the intergalactic space. And since, except for maybe some minor exceptions, almost every galaxy in the universe experienced a lot of collisions over time, it would make quite a lot of sense that this intergalactic light and these intergalactic stars are actually a huge component of the entire universe, but it's a component that's kind of invisible to us. Or at least it was up until now. This relatively recent study developed a new technique that can actually help us discover more of this light and uncover more of these stars. But even though it kind of makes sense to find these stars today, What's intriguing is that up until about two decades ago, nobody actually knew that they even existed. As a matter of fact, up until late 90s, most scientists believed that most stars are only going to be inside galaxies, not outside of them. But in 1997, by looking at the extremely massive Virgo cluster, the largest, most massive cluster relatively close to us, the scientists were able to see intergalactic stars in huge numbers. Here we're talking about trillions of various stars, but pretty far away from nearby galaxies, at least 300,000 light years away. And the total mass of all of these stars in the Virgo cluster is actually much higher than even the largest galaxy in the cluster. And that includes the iconic M87 galaxy that became famous for the first picture of a black hole ever taken. Which of course suggested that these stars and this intergalactic light forms a relatively large, relatively massive part of the cluster, potentially representing up to 10% of all of the stars from all of the galaxies in that particular cluster. But because it's more diffuse and spread out over a relatively large volume, it is really, really difficult to detect and very difficult to see. And the scientists have even discovered some of these stars between the Andromeda and the Milky Way. The distance to the Andromeda galaxy is about 2.5 million light years. But between Milky Way and the Andromeda, nearly 700 different stars have already been discovered, stars that very likely came from smaller galaxies that were absorbed over time, or potentially escaped from Andromeda and the Milky Way, and are now traveling between galaxies. And the scientists have even detected supernova happening between galaxies, suggesting that really massive stars were somehow kicked out of those galaxies, eventually exploding millions of years later. But this intergalactic light is extremely dim. It's actually roughly around 50 times dimmer than the darkest spot in the night skies on planet Earth. Moreover, it's kind of hidden by a lot of brighter objects nearby, it's also hidden by a lot of other background light, making its detection extremely tricky. But in order to study galactic evolution and in order to actually understand how the entire universe evolved, detecting this light is kind of important. Like I mentioned, it sometimes represents up to about 10% of the entire mass of the galactic cluster. And so nearly 10% of all of the stars in the local group of galaxies are actually very likely outside of the galaxies, including outside of the Milky Way. Hiding somewhere in between various galaxies and essentially just floating through space and potentially orbiting some of the larger objects. And so to achieve this, the scientists behind this recent paper had to use one of the largest digital cameras available for astronomy. This is known as HSC or Hyper Supreme Cam a gigantic digital camera on top of the Subaru telescope, a camera that's been operating for nearly a decade and has actually been doing a pretty good job at taking a lot of photos, uncovering parts of the universe that were not visible to us before. And a lot of the data for this particular study came from Gamma, Galaxy and Mass Assembly Survey, an extremely detailed survey of a lot of different galaxies in a lot of different frequencies that's been slowly collected over the last few years to include a huge amount of different objects. But for this particular study, the scientists focused on a relatively unknown group of galaxies that doesn't even have a name, just a number. 
a group of galaxies over 2 billion light years away from us, located at a redshift of 0.2. And the reason this particular cluster was chosen was actually because it's not particularly massive and not particularly dense. There seem to be only three major galaxies here, with a relatively bright middle known as the Bright Cluster Group. And because it's pretty clear that these galaxies are interacting and very likely colliding with one another, or were colliding, two and a half billion years ago, it means that there are going to be a lot of intergalactic stuff, as all of these stars are being thrown out by galaxies that are tidally disrupted. But even here, by just looking at it with regular cameras, the intergalactic light is not really visible. And as a matter of fact, it kind of looks like this. The galaxies are still a little bit too bright, making everything else practically invisible. But by identifying the galaxies first, and by using a Python-based algorithm, it becomes possible to extract this light, to then be left with nothing but the intergalactic light itself. And that's what the scientists did, achieving this as a result. And so this glow that's left, that's intergroup light created by various intergalactic stars. But in this case, it's really also the algorithm that's very exciting. It can now be applied to a lot of other data and a lot of other images, and is modular enough to be applicable for pretty much any galaxy we're looking at. Which suggests that seeing this now is going to become a lot more common in future studies. But even here, the scientists made some other observations and other discoveries as well, specifically in regards to how these galaxies very likely evolved. Because here they don't just see the light, they also see some of the properties coming from these stars as well, things like metallicity and overall age of stars. And so the stars between galaxies seem to actually have different properties from the stars in the nearby galactic group. They seem to be much younger, and they also seem to possess more hydrogen and helium and a lot less other elements. Which led the scientists to identify where these stars very likely came from. It looks like they came from a much more distant galaxy that you see on the right, 1660615, because the composition and the age seems to be very similar, and very likely formed in a very similar way to how you see right here, stripped from that smaller galaxy, spread out across a larger area, but then attached in orbit around a larger, more massive object. Which in this case is that larger cluster in the middle. With all of this very likely happening 1 billion years before. Which confirms that this is probably how most of these stars form. But I guess the question is, do all of them form this way? Can there actually be enough gas in between galaxies to form actual new stars through some other process? Now this is a mystery a lot of scientists have been trying to solve for quite a while now, but there's no definitive answer yet. In the last few years, because of the advances in radio technology, the scientists have actually been able to discover quite a lot of really unusual objects and quite a lot of new interesting mysteries when it comes to radio signals. And just like that, very recently, only a few days ago from when I'm making this video, the scientists seem to have discovered yet another unusual, unexplained and somewhat powerful radio signal coming from a relatively nearby galaxy. A radio signal that currently does not have a very good explanation, although the scientists do provide at least one possible explanation, at least based on our current understanding of various radio signals somewhere out there in the universe. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this new unusual source and try to figure out exactly what it is, and obviously talk about what it's not. And let's start with that. It's very likely not aliens. To date, none of the radio signals we've found so far exhibited what you would expect from an artificial source. Pretty much every single radio signal we've discovered so far is just a little bit too unpredictable and a little bit too hectic features that you expect from a natural source. But despite of that, there are still a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to the variety of radio signals we've detected in the last few years. And once again, mostly because the radio telescopes have now become so extremely powerful. And though normally in the past we would usually have some kind of a theoretical explanation to what we're observing, as a matter of fact that's exactly how most of the previous detections have been explained, we've now reached a point where we're actually getting a lot more data from various telescopes than there are currently theories available to explain what's being seen. And also even looking for various explanations or for various studies and papers, for example online through sources like the Archive, the incredible service ran by the Cornell University, where I basically usually get all of the studies as well, have sort of become oversaturated with the amount of different releases and various papers. Every single day in astrophysics alone, there are at least a hundred different papers. And because of this, matching a phenomenon to a potential theory has become a bit of a challenge. And that's exactly what's happening with things like, for example, fast radio bursts, or the more recently discovered odd radio circles that we discussed in one of the previous videos, with this maybe even now having some kind of an explanation. 
But this new discovery coming from a galaxy known as NGC 2082, located approximately 60 million light years away from us, really highlights some of the challenges in modern astronomy. Even though this galaxy is relatively close to us compared to some of the other galaxies, it's been practically unexplored and has never really been studied by almost anyone. And if we were to take a look at where it's located compared to the Milky Way, it's somewhere in this region, roughly around 60 million light years away. It's basically somewhere right here. And so in some sense, this is one of the neighboring galaxies. Yet despite this, this galaxy has only been looked at once back in 1992, when there was a supernova detected coming from this region. Other than that, it's very difficult to find anything about it. And that's exactly why the scientists behind this paper decided to focus on this galaxy, because they wanted to explore some of the more unexplored regions in the night skies, and the galaxy is relatively close to us, nobody really studied before. NGC 2082 is one such galaxy, although there are quite a lot still unexplored. And pretty much right away, the scientists behind the study you can find in the description below, were able to find this previously unseen radio source that was actually pretty powerful, but unseen simply because nobody ever looked here. Discovered using the very powerful Australia Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, along with the Parkes Radio Telescope and the Australia Telescope Compact Array. A relatively large network of really, really powerful radio telescopes, which already have discovered a lot of radio mysteries in the last decade. And so what exactly do we know about the signal and about the galaxy where all of this is coming from? Well, first of all, as I mentioned before, not much is known about the galaxy itself. NGC 2082 is one of thousands of different galaxies in the so-called New General Catalog, commonly abbreviated to NGC. And of thousands of galaxies on the list, there are still quite a lot that haven't really been explored by anyone. But we do know some things about this based on the Hubble imagery. First of all, this galaxy seems to have quite a lot of individual bright blue stars, which obviously suggests that there is quite a lot of star formation. And one of these stars went supernova back in 1992. We also understand that this spiral galaxy seems to have a relatively dense central bulge right in the middle of the galaxy, and quite a lot of different filaments of dark dust that seems to be located in its spiral arms. Although honestly none of these features are unusual and a lot of different spiral galaxies with spiral arms will often contain them. But somewhere in the middle of the galaxy, a little bit off one of its arms, there is an unusually strong radio signal emitting relatively large amounts of radio waves. But at the moment, because of the strength of the signal, it's really hard to explain it. For example, if this signal was coming from a nearby galaxy or much closer to us, even within the Milky Way, we would probably explain this as a pulsar or possibly some other radio neutron star. Or maybe an even more unusual phenomenon, sometimes known as the plurion or pulsar wind, which is usually formed by various pulsars interacting with a lot of gas in the region. In this case, interacting with the cloud nearby. Or it could also be coming from certain types of nebula, but once again, they would have to be much, much closer. And so normally, in order to produce these powerful radio signals from this far away, you would require some kind of a supermassive black hole with quite a lot of power on the inside to drive all of these radio emissions. And so normally, these types of powerful signals are observed coming from radio galaxies such as the iconic Hercules A we've discussed relatively recently, or some more powerful objects such as distant quasars, objects that are billions and billions of years old. But this is not a radio galaxy, nor is it a quasar, so what exactly is happening here? And also, as you can see, this is not in the center of this galaxy either. So unless there is some kind of a supermassive black hole in this region, which by the way is a possibility, at the moment this is still a bit of a mystery. But there are some clues based on the polarization and based on the size of the object that's emitting this. So here, by analyzing polarization of light coming from this radio signal, and by studying the frequency along with the overall power, the scientists definitively determined that this cannot be coming from a relatively large object such as, for example, a nebula. This has to be a somewhat compact object. In other words, it has to be really, really small. And based on the frequency and the emission type, they also don't think it's a supernova remnant or any kind of a pulsar either. As a matter of fact, they think it's a source that has a lot of heat, with the radio emissions possibly having thermal origin as a source. And based on the location of this particular signal, it also seems to have certain similarities with fast radio bursts. But it doesn't seem to be as bright as a typical FRB, and doesn't possess the same type of repetition or the same type of a profile. And so by process of illumination, the scientists were left with only one potential explanation, although it's not really clear if it's the best one just yet. 
the explanation here is I guess not super exciting. So it could be a quasar, or even some kind of a radio galaxy, simply located behind NGC 2082, with its jets piercing through this galaxy and thus sort of making it look like it's coming from the galaxy itself. In other words, the explanation here is that it's not really coming from this galaxy at all, but from somewhere behind it. And because of the amount of polarization in certain frequencies that's also observed in various radio galaxies and various quasars, to some extent this does maybe provide the explanation. But a lot more confirmation is needed before this can be established. For example, looking at various types of neutral atomic hydrogen, which could maybe confirm these assumptions by looking at the interaction between hydrogen and the radio signals. But since the probability of such an object being behind a galaxy is only about 1.2%, at the moment the scientists are not sure if this is really the best explanation. Whoa, it looks like I have a halo. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. And today we're going to be discussing these objects that you see behind me. We're going to be talking about ring galaxies, and specifically some of the recent discoveries in regards to these unusual objects but also briefly talk about what we know and don't know about them, because even today these are still very mysterious objects. Or to be more specific, very mysterious galaxies that are actually quite rare and whose origin is still somewhat difficult to explain, at least in some cases. But let's start with the basics. Generally, when it comes to different types of galaxies, we can sort of divide them into three main types. We have spiral galaxies, like the one we live in, the Milky Way galaxy. We have elliptical galaxies, with the most famous one being M87, where the scientists took a picture of the central black hole. And then we have something known as the irregular galaxies, similar to the satellites of the Milky Way, Large Magellanic Cloud and Small Magellanic Cloud. These galaxies generally represent the vast majority of everything we see in the universe. But even a hundred years ago, the scientists already started collecting a kind of a database of another type of galaxies that they usually refer to as peculiar galaxies. Basically, unusual galaxies that do not fit into one of these categories. And just like the name implies, usually these galaxies will have something strange about them. And the most famous database that basically has all these galaxies collected is known as ARP, Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. And some of these peculiar galaxies would often contain some kind of an elliptical galaxy, usually a relatively small one, very often surrounded by a ring or even several rings. And in some cases, these rings would be quite incredible but in other cases they would be actually almost like the main part of the galaxy, while in other cases they might even form even stranger shapes. But in pretty much most cases all of these rings will usually contain extremely bright blue stars, which very often represents extremely young stars that recently formed somewhere in this galaxy. And today the scientists believe that at least 1 in 10,000 of all galaxies out there is going to be some kind of a ring galaxy which basically represents like 0.01% of all the galaxies out there, doesn't sound like a lot, but that means that there are probably up to about 200 million different galaxies containing rings in the observable universe. Based on the approximate number of galaxies we think currently exists in the observable universe. And not so long ago, the Citizen Scientists project, ran by several scientists, combined the power from thousands of different volunteers in helping identify various galaxies with artificial intelligence to essentially discover 40,000 new ring galaxies we never knew existed, with many of them featuring a lot of different formations which are not particularly easy to explain. In this particular case, the scientists used an algorithm known as Zubot that you can actually find in the description below to sort of train the AI in identifying various galaxies really quickly, suggesting of course that there are quite a lot of these galaxies out there but making them still kind of rare. And more importantly, highlighting the important point. We still don't entirely understand how all of these galaxies form, but we now might actually have an explanation for at least some of them. At least for some of the more famous ones. Maybe not all of them, but definitely some of them. But I guess let's start right here with the most famous of them all, the original one, the Hoag's object, named after the astronomer who originally found this. This is actually a simulation created by NASA, technically a sonification, where you can kind of hear what this galaxy would, I guess, sound like if you were to convert some of these frequencies into sounds. Let's listen. Now, the interesting thing about Hoag's object 
is that if you actually look really closely at some of the images of this object, you'll discover that there's another ring galaxy inside of it. And considering the rarity of these objects, this event by itself, the alignment in this case, is ridiculously rare. Obviously, because of the redshift, the small galaxy is much, much farther away. But nevertheless, this is a pretty interesting and quite an unusual coincidence. And the other thing about this galaxy is that even today, even after all of these explanations, we still don't really know how it formed. This is still the most mysterious ring galaxy out there, and nobody knows exactly what happened to give it this perfect shape. But we might be able to get some answers from some of the other galaxies that the scientists have explored before. And in this case, the first hint, I guess, comes from where we usually find these galaxies. So normally, if you were to look around the universe, you would usually find these galaxies either by themselves or with very, very few partners. You are quite unlikely to discover these galaxies in large galactic clusters with a lot of mass inside. And that by itself already presents a bit of a hint. It seems that these galaxies generally form in locations where there is not a lot of interaction with other galaxies. And that, to scientists, implies that they might actually possess a lot of gas, a lot of gas that has not been touched by anything. This gas, in effect, if condensed in just the right way, or if moved by something, can then suddenly start forming clumps, and then start the starburst activity that's often visible from really far away, and is often responsible for producing some of these blue bright stars. In other words, the location seems to kind of matter, and also the amount of untouched gas present in these galaxies. But I guess what's still kind of difficult to explain is the gap between the blue stars and the central, much older region that usually possesses a lot of red stars. These are stars that are extremely old and might have existed in this galaxy for over 5 billion years. Whereas the stars on the outskirts are much, much younger, with some only being several million years old. Now, when these galaxies were just discovered, there were quite a lot of unusual explanations. For example, some scientists thought that maybe these are just gravitational lensing effects. Kind of like the typical Einstein ring that usually forms from very massive clusters. But pretty quickly, the scientists proved that this was not the case. Some scientists thought that maybe this is actually just a kind of an alignment between an object that seems to be really far away and really close. In other words, instead of having two objects together, we're just basically looking at one ring and one galaxy somewhere far away or much closer to us. That's also not the case because the redshift measurements for each one of these galaxies establish that all these objects are connected together and that a lot of these rings are actually surrounding the galaxy and seem to contain the mass coming from the galaxy itself. But certain ring galaxies, like the one that you see right here, also suggest that some of these rings are not necessarily circular. Some of them seem to be stretched and resemble an object that possesses an elliptical orbit. Now, because of the distribution of the gas and the stars in this ring, it becomes possible to figure out what most likely happened to this galaxy. In this case, we can clearly see that there are quite a lot of new stars forming around the ring, but that in certain regions, the gas and the actual star formation is much higher in terms of density. And on top of this, the elongated shape sort of suggests some kind of a gravitational interaction with something else. Possibly this other galaxy that's sort of nearby. But it's sort of difficult to establish distances in space, and it's kind of difficult to judge if this galaxy actually did undergo some kind of a collision. But the scientists managed to figure this out by looking at this in the X-rays, and specifically by using the iconic Chandra X-ray Observatory. In this case, you're looking at the same galaxy, but from a, I guess, slightly shifted perspective. That other galaxy nearby is now somewhere right here, and we have another galaxy relatively close to it. Now, if we look at the optical light, it doesn't really seem like anything is going on here. But if we look at the X-ray light, we suddenly see that because of the interaction, there is now a much higher production of possibly black holes and neutron stars, which are emitting a lot of X-rays. And this seems to happen both in the ring galaxy and both of the galaxies next to it, more so in the one on the left. Here's what all this sort of looks like if you combine both the optical light and the X-ray light. And you can actually almost see a kind of a line stretching between these two galaxies right here. Which to the scientists behind several studies suggested that the explanation for these rings is essentially some kind of a galactic passage where one galaxy shot through the other one, in some sense creating a kind of a ripple effect which then forced a lot of gas surrounding the galaxy to form over density which then started to produce new stars. 
but because there could be three galaxies involved here, some of these rings ended up a little bit skewed and not perfectly circular. And so to some extent, this gives us a kind of a hint on what might have happened in a lot of these ring galaxies. Like for example, something similar could have happened here, maybe a little bit more extreme because it does look like one of the rings is now sort of even missing the galaxy in the middle. And in this case, it seems to only really happen to these lonely galaxies or galaxies far away from clusters, which usually have a lot of gas on the inside. And so when this gas is disturbed by some kind of a passage or some kind of a collision, where another galaxy goes through it, it might result in a sudden production of stars from all of this extra gas. And some of the other galaxies, like one of the nearest ones to us, NGC 1291, even shows us how these galaxies evolve afterwards. You can sort of see how the ring dissipates and even turns into a kind of a spiral structure. Here's a slightly more detailed observation here, with the ring becoming the spiral with time. And here's what it looks like in the ultraviolet light and the visible light. And they all actually seem to evolve slightly differently. There's another really iconic galaxy known as the Cartwheel Galaxy that represents one of the most remarkable ring galaxies we've found so far. Remarkable because of these unusual filaments that seem to connect the ring to the rest of the galaxy. Which is why it got the name Cartwheel, because it sort of looks like a cartwheel. And in this case, it's believed that that other nearby galaxy that's also forming a lot of young stars might have basically caused the formation of the ring in this galaxy. Although in the case of the smaller galaxy, it did not form a ring, it formed something else. And the more detailed observations in other types of light essentially show the scientists that this galaxy is slowly reforming its original spiral shape. So basically that's, once again, a kind of a transition galaxy, with the ring galaxy slowly becoming the spiral galaxy once again. And that's how the scientists believe these cartwheel spokes form as well. But obviously some of these collisions would be pretty difficult to explain, especially because the original galaxy is sort of gone. Or maybe it just becomes so dim that it becomes almost impossible to detect it. Either way, in most cases, collisions seem to explain the formation of these unusual rings. Although in some cases, like in this galaxy known as Zwicky 228, it's even been suggested that maybe the galaxy itself got stretched into the ring because of the collision. Especially if it's almost a head-on collision between two relatively massive galaxies. But more importantly, several different galaxies have been discovered in the process of essentially becoming ring galaxies. This one I guess being one of the more famous ones. In this case, it's pretty obvious that there are two galaxies colliding, with one of them already sort of forming into a ring. Maybe not a perfect ring, but ring nevertheless. Which, at least to some extent, takes care of this mystery of how these unusual galaxies form. But there's one small problem, or possibly a couple of these. Hoag's object and a few other similar galaxies seem to be the peculiar types of the ring galaxies. First of all, they're just a little bit too perfect. Second of all, they don't seem to contain any neighbors as in they don't actually have another galaxy near them that could have activated the formation of the ring. And so even though this is technically considered to be a prototype for a typical ring galaxy, in this case it seems to be an exception. This galaxy might have formed in an entirely different way. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and once again we have a new record holder. This tiny red blob you see right here that's the most distant galaxy ever found, as of April of 2022. And it comes to us only weeks after the discovery of the farthest star we've ever seen, known as Arendelle, that I've discussed in a video that you can find somewhere right there or in the description below. And so in this video, let's actually discuss exactly what this galaxy represents, what it means for our understanding of the formation of the universe, talk a little bit about why this galaxy was discovered to be really strange and somewhat difficult to explain, and also talk about the previous discovery, which I'm going to start with right now. So a couple of years ago, we've talked about a galaxy known as GNZ11, or Z11 for those of you in Canada. Z11 in this case represents the so-called redshift. In this case, this galaxy possessed the redshift of 11. And because of the distances involved here, the only reasonable way of measuring how far away these galaxies are is by essentially measuring the redshift of various ultraviolet emissions usually coming from the formation of different stars. So let me demonstrate how all of this works. What you're looking at right here are various galaxies very close to the Milky Way. And if I were to start zooming in here, 
at some point I would start seeing galaxies that are extremely redshifted. They're going to appear extremely red. So for example, here's one such distant red galaxy. Now the redshift in this case is obviously due to the distances, but all of the light that used to be optical, basically the light that we can receive with our own eyes, has now actually become infrared. So it would not really be visible to us. What we are seeing, however, is actually ultraviolet light. The frequency of light that's not visible to the human eye, but because of the distances traveled, has now become other frequency that we cannot see. Very, very long infrared waves. And generally, by identifying the exact redshift, the scientists can then estimate distances. And so this previous record holder, GNZ11, was the highest redshift galaxy ever found, located in the constellation of Ursa Major. And when it was originally discovered, it was definitely the oldest galaxy known to us. Here's roughly what this galaxy might actually look like based on some of the observations. The images that we detected from it came from approximately 13.4 billion years ago, when the universe was only 400 million years old. With the rough estimate of distances between Earth and this galaxy being about 32 billion years. In this case, it's not 13.4 billion light years, simply because the universe is also expanding as the light travels. And back when it was discovered, it was also assumed to be basically at the limit of the capabilities of modern telescopes, including Hubble telescope. It was more or less located so far away that we really shouldn't even be seeing anything coming from here. In some sense, this was already a bit of an anomaly. And on top of this, it was also in that period of time known as Reionization Era, during the period known as the Cosmic Dawn. The period of time when the universe was pretty much almost entirely dark, because there was not enough light produced by anything, and most of the gas in between galaxies, or between early galaxies, was essentially neutral hydrogen, which didn't really allow for a lot of light to pass. And so we call this the Dark Ages, and this particular period slowly started to transform the universe and re-ionize all of this gas, creating what we have today, the universe that we sort of understand and know very well. But all of this took some time, almost a billion years. And even this discovery was very close to the so-called Dark Ages. We don't expect much light from this region. This galaxy was already 150 million years older than the previous record holder. The galaxy you see right there, known as EGS Y8P7. But it was detected, and it was not even that unusual. As a matter of fact, a lot of things about this galaxy kind of made sense. The stars here in the galaxy itself were approximately 40 million years old, it was about 1 25th the size of the Milky Way, and only possessed about 1% of the total mass of the Milky Way. But it was a rapidly growing galaxy, producing stars extremely quickly. With the galaxy very likely looking something like this, a typical small starburst galaxy. But this time, the scientists identified something that they cannot actually explain very well. They found two more potential galaxies, even farther away, even younger, located at the redshift of 13.3, which is about 70 million years before GNZ11, or approximately 330 million years after the universe began. And generally it's believed that during that period, well, there were probably not a lot of galaxies out there, if any. The stars were just kind of starting, and they were just clumping together. This was literally the beginning of the cosmic dawn. And on top of this, all of the previous detections using the most powerful telescopes, including Hubble, have actually failed to find anything that far. But that's of course because Hubble is not the best telescope when it comes to infrared observations. That title is going to belong to James Webb Telescope when it becomes fully operational. And so for this study, the scientists used the data from four different infrared surveys and telescopes, including the Subaru Telescope, the Visible and Infrared Survey Telescope for Astronomy, United Kingdom Infrared Telescope, and NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope as well. And then essentially combined approximately 1200 hours of observation time from these four different telescopes looking at one particular spot. In this case, looking for what's known as the Lyman Bray galaxies, the galaxies with a lot of star production on the inside that usually produce very specific types of frequencies. And in the process, they analyzed approximately 700,000 different objects, discovering two interesting candidates. 
The galaxy they refer to as HD1 at the redshift of 13.3 and the one known as HD2 slightly closer at 12.3. And they did so by knowing exactly what frequencies they should be detecting, assuming a certain redshift at a certain location. And in this case, they found the frequencies they were looking for, which were then discovered to be these particular galaxies, with HD1 being the farthest, with the approximate distance of this galaxy from planet Earth being about 33.5 billion light years away from us. But, as I mentioned in the beginning, this galaxy is not without mysteries. It seems to be unusually bright in the ultraviolet wavelengths, which actually suggests that it's extremely energetic. Something extremely active is happening in this galaxy, and it's currently not something we can explain. So, for example, based on the preliminary calculations, if this is a so-called starburst galaxy, similar to GNZ11 that I discussed previously, it would require this galaxy to be at least 10 times more active. It would be producing approximately 100 masses of the sun per year, which would be almost impossible to explain using modern science. This galaxy here was producing at least 10 times less. On the other hand, if it's not a starburst galaxy, but some sort of an extremely powerful quasar, or basically if all of this ultraviolet light is produced through the activity of some kind of a central black hole and astrophysical jets, in this case, once again, the actual jets are way too bright. It would require a supermassive black hole at least 100 million masses of the Sun, and we don't expect such black holes to exist so early in the universe. Currently, there is really no explanation for how such a massive black hole could exist so early after the creation of the universe itself. And so, if not an active starburst galaxy, and if not a superactive quasar, how exactly is it able to produce so much energy? way more energy than expected at this period of time. Well, right now the scientists only have one potential explanation, although I'm sure more will come with time. The explanation here is in regards to the types of stars we believe existed in this early universe, so-called population 3 stars. They don't actually exist anymore because all of them sort of went supernova and created population 2 and population 1 stars. But in essence, these would be extremely bright, extremely massive, and very powerful stars, potentially producing way more UV light than normal stars. And by producing more UV light, they could technically explain what we're seeing here. So in other words, the explanation here is that, well, maybe the stars were actually very different back then. Maybe they were just much more powerful than we imagine. Way different from typical stars we see in our own galaxy or in galaxies nearby. But that's of course a somewhat hypothetical explanation, and it doesn't really have much proof behind it, especially any theoretical proof in regards to population 3 stars. So for now, it's just a really big mystery. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and when it comes to galaxies, there are only a few that are actually iconic. And one of them is right here. This is known as the Cartwheel Galaxy. The galaxy that you can see right here in the picture from Hubble and a galaxy that I've recently mentioned in one of the videos about ring galaxies, because this is actually one of the most iconic ring galaxies out there, and allowed the scientists back in the day to essentially explain how we today believe a lot of ring galaxies form. You can actually learn a little bit more about this in this other video that should be in the description below. But very recently, the scientists announced that they released new pictures and have conducted new observations of the region where this galaxy is located by using the infrared instruments on the James Webb. In the process, seeing this galaxy in new light and providing some new observations and new explanations for what we now believe happened here a few hundred million years ago. And so let's discuss these new pictures and these new observations in more detail and talk a little bit more about this iconic galaxy that sort of forms one of the most beautiful formations out there in the night skies, even though technically you would need a very powerful telescope to actually see this. And let's actually start right here. This is a simulation of this galaxy in Space Engine, and you can sort of see that it's not an only single galaxy here. There are at least three galaxies sort of connected to one another gravitationally, although as some of the X-ray observations revealed, there are potentially a lot more here, with most simply being relatively difficult to see because of the distances. And originally, this galaxy was discovered by Fritz Zwicky, the Swiss astronomer famous for coining the term dark matter. He was essentially the first to discover these unusual phenomena that he could not explain and called them dark matter because it was some kind of invisible matter that nobody could see. But in 1941, 
he also discovered another mystery he could not explain. He actually considered it to be the most complicated structure that still had no explanation and could not be explained with simple stellar dynamics. Here we had four physically connected galaxies, spiral galaxies, with three being relatively close and one being slightly farther away. You can actually sort of see the fourth one in the top right corner. And so these galaxies presented early astronomers with a new mystery. How exactly did they acquire these unusual shapes? And at a distance of just under 500 million light years away from us, or approximately 250 times as far away as the nearby Andromeda galaxy, it was relatively difficult for the early astronomers to see the detail required to explain what happened here. But because of the recent detailed observations in the X-rays, visual light and infrared light, the scientists are pretty certain they know what happened here. This is a result of one of many different types of galactic collisions, in this case between relatively large and relatively massive galaxies. In this case, the Cartwheel galaxy is just a little bit smaller and less massive than the Andromeda at roughly around 145,000 light years across. Although its size might have actually increased because of the collision with one of the galaxies near it, very likely the one that you see in the top left. But obviously the question is, why exactly does it have such a strange shape? Normally when we see galactic collisions, they sort of produce more irregular shapes and sometimes result in the formation of what's known as the elliptical galaxy, which might then lead to a formation of a spiral galaxy. As a matter of fact, a lot of galactic collisions look somewhat different to begin with. Well, as I've discussed in that previous video about the ring galaxy formations, sometimes when the orientation between colliding galaxies is just right, one of the galaxies might end up shooting through the other galaxy in such a way that it essentially forms a bunch of ripples around it. With the ripples in this case being represented by the hydrogen gas, and a lot of these ripples will then produce a lot of higher density regions in a kind of a circular formation, which will then initiate star formation, but in this case, in a circle around the galaxy. Although because there are other galaxies involved in this case, the circle is not really perfect like in other ring galaxies, and is thus a little bit distorted. In this case, we actually have two different rings in this galaxy, very likely from multiple collisions, with the outer ring having a velocity of about 270 kilometers per second as it moves around the galaxy. And as you can see from the X-ray observations, there are quite a lot of very active regions, very likely producing a lot of black holes and neutron stars because of an extremely active formation of really massive stars. As a matter of fact, very recently, just a year ago, the scientists detected a supernova in this region. Here's what it sort of looked like when it happened just a few months ago from when I'm making this video. As you can see, it was pretty powerful and quite bright. But what makes this galaxy unique and somewhat interesting is not really the rings, as much as the structure between the rings, the cartwheel spokes. And that of course makes this galaxy very complicated and extremely intriguing. These unusual spokes even seem to connect the outer ring with the inner ring. And this is not something we often see around galaxies, as a matter of fact, it's the only galaxy known to us that seems to possess such strong formations. But in this case, these formations very likely represent a bunch of reforming spiral arms that are slowly being developed after the collision that very likely happened 200 to 300 million years ago. Which of course implies that back in the days this was probably a typical spiral galaxy with typical spiral arms. The arms that were destroyed during a major collision. However, following this collision, some of the previous dynamic forces started to slowly rebuild these arms and created these spokes we see connecting the two rings with the new images from the James Webb telescope revealing new details about all of the star formation and about these spokes. So first of all, this image right here, taken with the near-infrared instrument, definitively shows us that this existing structure on the inside seems to be slowly disintegrating and is actually reforming a spiral galaxy. If you look at this in more detail in one of the links in the description below, you can actually see this really, really bright core containing huge amounts of hot dust that seems to contain a lot of giant star clusters that were previously invisible to us. Whereas as before, we can see a lot of young active stars on the outskirts with the ring that very likely expanded for the past 400 million years still forcing a lot of new stars to form because of the higher presence of dust in this area. And a lot of detail produced by this instrument 
shows us quite a lot of clumpy areas associated with younger star formation, as opposed to older stars that generally produce much smoother areas. As a matter of fact, every blue dot you see in this image represents some kind of a star or a small pocket of star formation. And here we can actually see that the star formation only happens in certain regions and mostly along the spokes or along the outer ring. But in order to learn even more detail about this galaxy, the scientists looked at this using MIRI or the Mid-Infrared Instrument. The instrument that produced a very different image showing us completely different detail. This here actually shows us mostly hydrocarbons and a lot of silicate dust or the stuff we usually find on various planets and various rocky objects. And so here we can actually see the regions that are extremely rich in a lot of these elements with once again mostly the rings and the spokes having most of these materials. The rest of the galaxy is pretty much empty. But more importantly, this image right here definitively solves the mystery of this being a transitionary galaxy. A galaxy that's slowly turning from a ring galaxy into a typical spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. And more importantly, points at that other neighbor that you can see in the top left as the most likely culprit that caused all these rings to form. The satellite galaxy that you see right here that's sometimes referred to as G2. And so this whole structure will very likely disintegrate completely in the next few hundreds of millions of years, with a lot of the gas and the stars on the outskirts most likely making their way toward the center, which some of them already seem to have started doing, and eventually reforming some kind of a spiral galaxy with very prominent spiral arms, potentially resembling the galaxy that you see right here known as the Pinwheel Galaxy. And altogether, these observations more or less solve the mystery of many different ring galaxies out there and kind of show us what happens when certain galaxies receive a collision right in the middle and very likely from a very specific perpendicular direction. Although in this case, because as you can see the ring is not perfect, something else might have disturbed the shape afterwards. Not so long ago, we've discussed a new discovery of the farthest galaxy in the universe. The galaxy that you're about to see in this video that I'm about to show you. And the galaxy located pretty far away. Although it's more accurate to say pretty long time ago. Mostly because the distances in this case kind of start to become a little bit irrelevant. As a matter of fact, this particular galaxy is so far away that even its name contains its redshift which basically defines its distance, or as I mentioned, its age. This galaxy is known as GM-Z11, with Z11 in this case representing the redshift of 11, equivalent to the age when the universe was only about 400 million years old, and the approximate distance to this galaxy being about 32 billion light years. The reason why it's not 13.4 billion is because of the expansion of the universe. We've discussed this in some of the previous videos that might be somewhere in the description. But discovering this galaxy took quite a long time, and quite a lot of analysis, and a lot of and a lot of investigations. Yet now, something happened completely by accident. The scientists found something else. Something even farther away, based on the relatively newly released image from the James Webb Telescope. The image that only took a few hours to create, with the data and the image essentially being a kind of a test run, implying, of course, that when the James Webb Telescope starts to observe objects directly and for a long time, we're going to start discovering some incredibly far away objects even farther away than anything we've ever seen before. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more about this new paper and the new discovery, which will hopefully highlight how incredibly powerful the James Webb Telescope is compared to any other tool previously used by the scientists. So just as a reminder, this particular image, unofficially referred to as the James Webb Deep Field, only took about 12 and a half hours to produce. Whereas the Hubble Ultra Deep Field that you see right here took a few months to produce and the earlier version of the image took at least 10 days. Which means that the James Webb Telescope is able to capture so much more light and see so much farther away in much much shorter time than any previous telescope we've had before. Which sort of makes sense, of course, because one of the main purposes for this telescope is to try to discover what the edge of the universe sort of looks like and to try to discover these super faraway galaxies that are practically invisible in optical light. And so the scientists specifically designed this telescope in order to detect these really faraway galaxies as old as 13.8 billion years, if of course they existed back then. 
It should still be able to see the light from the really early universe pretty easily once it starts its observations and continuously points the mirrors in the same direction. But as you can see from this image created by NASA, James Webb Telescope essentially covers a really big part of the infrared spectrum, much wider than the Spitzer Telescope and something that the Hubble was never able to do well either. And this is of course super important because a lot of these super ancient objects the objects that very likely looked extremely bright produced a lot of different types of starlight and emitted a lot of different types of energy, by now had their light redshifted so much that all of this visible and even ultraviolet light became extremely redshifted and now appears to us as infrared light, with some light even reaching the microwave spectrum. Which of course means that we're not really able to see these galaxies with a typical telescope such as the Hubble telescope but James Webb can see them really, really well. And more specifically, it's able to directly observe that era in the beginning of the universe, often referred to as the Dark Ages, when the stars just started forming, the galaxies started to develop, and the universe was still not particularly transparent. Something that started approximately 375,000 years after the beginning of the Big Bang expansion, but most likely ended within about 1 to 1.1 billion years. And so during that time, things were not particularly clear. And so it's actually kind of difficult to see those things and to study that particular part of the universe. But this telescope makes it slightly easier. As a matter of fact, as this recent study discovered, it makes it a lot easier. And so the scientists behind this paper, with the title Two Remarkably Luminous Galaxy Candidates at Redshift 11 to 13, revealed by James Webb Telescope, pretty much tells us exactly what this paper is all about. First of all, it reminds us that we've only discovered one single galaxy at a redshift of over 10, when the universe was approximately 500 million years or younger. And that's of course the GNZ11 galaxy I previously mentioned. But second of all, they're able to discover not one, but two separate galaxies at ridiculously faraway distances of redshift 11 to even redshift 13, which officially means that this galaxy is no longer the farthest ever found. It's now this tiny blob, which when zoomed in would probably look something like this, with this new galaxy referred to as GLASS-Z13. Wait, GLASS? Why GLASS? Well, it's actually the name of a survey or the early release data from the infrared imager on top of the James Webb telescope that released all of this data approximately a month ago, somewhere in mid-June of 2022. And somewhere in this data, the scientists realized that some of the really ancient, really powerful light was actually being absorbed by a lot of the neutral hydrogen that used to exist in the early universe and ended up absorbing a lot of the light that we just cannot see anymore. Nevertheless, by looking at the data from the James Webb, they were able to discover several patches where something was clearly being absorbed, some kind of ancient radiation. And because in this case, the emissions that were being absorbed are very likely what's known as the Lyman-alpha emissions or the emissions of hydrogen usually coming from extremely powerful galaxies that we've seen in a lot of different places. In this case, by using all of this data, it became possible to work out the redshift to these really far away invisible objects, with one of them being a little bit closer to us compared to the previous record holder and one of them being super far away. The distance in this case would be about 33 billion light years away from us, with the universe being only about 300 million years old. That's actually the time when we think stars only started forming. And so naturally this represents some of the earliest universe we've ever observed. Quite a lot of mysteries here, quite a lot of uncertainties, and quite a lot of potential discoveries. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries coming from a very intriguing region known as the Zone of Avoidance. The region that you can kind of see in this video right here. But what exactly is it, and why is it called that, and what exactly did the scientists discover? And the reason why it's called the Zone of Avoidance is kind of intriguing. During the early astronomy days in the 18th and 19th century, as the astronomers started to discover a lot of new objects in the night skies, they started to notice all sorts of different type of nebula, like the one you see right there. And these were actually pretty common everywhere, and they started to be described by a lot of different studies. But some of these nebulae had very specific shapes. They became known as the spiral nebula, mostly because they had an unusual spiral shape. And there were quite a lot of them discovered during those early astronomy days, and they were pretty much all over the place, no matter where you looked, except for one area. Roughly around 10 degrees of night skies were completely devoid of any spiral nebula. 
Other types of nebula were still present here, but not the spiral ones. And so because of this, some of the early astronomers in the 19th century started to refer to this as the zone of avoidance. For some reason, there were no spiral nebula in that particular region. And if you know anything about the history of astronomy, you probably already figured out why. These unusual spiral nebula that the scientists were seeing were actually something that looked like this. They were not nebula at all, they were galaxies. But it wasn't until the late 1920s, or even more like 1930s, that the scientists finally realized that the universe was much, much bigger than we ever thought. And that essentially each of these spiral nebula were actually individual galaxies with their own nebula on the inside. This was actually following something known as the Great Debate that happened roughly around 100 years ago, and you can learn more about it in the video in the description. And so essentially Zone of Avoidance did not have any galaxies present in it. And eventually the scientists realized why. They were most likely there, but they were just invisible to us because of a huge amount of dust hiding all of them. And that's because that particular region is literally the center of our galaxy. The region that you see right here, where quite a lot of dust is present right in the middle of the Milky Way and is essentially hiding pretty much everything behind it. It's a little bit easier to visualize it right here in these images created by various surveys with this whole region representing almost like a wall of dust hiding almost everything behind it. Which is also why this region has always been so mysterious because it does seem to hide quite a lot of intriguing stuff. But naturally it's really only invisible to us in the optical light. It starts to appear a little bit different in the infrared and a lot of other frequencies including of course radio light which suddenly uncovers quite a lot of stuff we were not able to see before. And so in the last few decades the scientists did start to make some discoveries finding certain objects hiding here and even finding objects that were behind our galaxy in that particular direction. And that's actually precisely what the scientists want to study. They really want to kind of see through this and try to find out what's actually hiding behind it millions or even billions of light years away from us. And one of the most important reasons why the scientists want to do so can be seen in this image. This is also where the mysterious great attractor is located, which seems to represent the most gravitationally potent area attracting everything in the vicinity and making everything, including the Milky Way, moving toward that point. At the moment, nobody knows what it is, what's creating all this gravitational attraction, or why all of the millions of galaxies are actually moving toward this point, but by being able to see through the zone avoidance, we might be able to finally solve this mystery. And so, in the last few decades, the scientists have been finding new ways to try to see through this, to try to peer through all of this dust, and to actually discover new objects. And because approximately 10 to 20% of the entire night skies is hidden behind all of this, it's actually one of the most exciting areas to study. And some of the first breakthroughs were made by the Italian Paolo Maffei, who used one of the first infrared surveys to discover two galaxies. Back then he was one of the most famous astronomers slash astrophysicists, and definitely laid the foundation for how the scientists would then look for new objects using very similar techniques. And so he discovered two galaxies, they are now known as Maffei 1 and Maffei 2, both of which are only visible in the infrared, and both of which are basically in the zone of avoidance. For example, in this image by NASA, you can even barely see it, visible as a tiny tiny galaxy on the bottom. And the pioneering techniques from Paolo Maffei eventually led to a lot of new discoveries and of course the propositions for bigger infrared telescopes, including eventually James Webb that we have right now. Although even in the infrared light, there is still quite a lot of noise here and a lot of things are still hidden from the view. And that's actually because there are also a lot of other objects, including various stars, that create a problem when telling things apart. It's actually kind of difficult to tell if something is close to us or far away. But later surveys decided to do something different. They also used radio emissions, or basically radio wavelengths, the wavelengths that can easily see through most of the dust in a galaxy, to try to discover even more distant objects by, for example, looking at the hydrogen line, also known as 21 centimeter emission line, which in the process did discover more galaxies. Or two galaxies, Dwingaloo 1 and Dwingaloo 2. These were almost invisible in the infrared light and were only detected later on after the scientists were able to identify them using radio frequencies. And because some of these galaxies were actually really massive and really big, the fact that they are invisible to us makes this area extremely exciting to study. Because essentially every single discovery here becomes kind of groundbreaking and takes us a little bit closer to being able to see through all of this at some point. And thus of course maybe one day answering the question of 
what exactly is the Great Attractor? But after decades and decades of almost no discoveries, the scientists finally made a really big one. They've discovered something really, really far away, hidden behind our galaxy, something that seems to represent an extremely massive structure, the most massive structure ever detected in this region. A structure containing several galaxies and potentially up to 58 galaxies, which seems to be the largest galactic cluster discovered in the last few years, and discovered using a really complex analysis involving several infrared telescopes, with the first one an extremely detailed triple V survey being the one responsible for discovering an unusually high intensity region that was surprisingly located in the zone of avoidance, previously unseen by anything and completely unexplained until recently. And once the scientists realized that there's something going on here, they used additional observations from other infrared telescopes, confirming five separate galaxies, all at the same distance and all connected gravitationally, but also eventually realizing that there could be up to 58 galaxies here, making this essentially a galactic cluster. Something that we obviously have seen many times before in other regions, but something that would make it the first such object detected in a zone of avoidance. And that of course is a really important discovery because of that mystery of the Great Attractor. By being able to detect this object, and by being able to analyze it directly, discovering the distance and the total mass of this structure, and by essentially revealing all of these galaxies that were previously invisible to us, using a completely new analysis and a completely new technique, it takes us a step closer to now being able to possibly see what's hiding in the Great Attractor region and thus figure out what actually is causing all of this gravitational attraction. For many centuries, we used stars to navigate. But in the last few decades, the scientists realized that there is actually something even better, something even brighter, something that produces the brightest light in the universe visible from the edge of the observable universe itself. Objects that we believe represent a super or sometimes ultra-massive black hole, absorbing a huge amount of mass, producing extremely bright environments around itself, and shining with a light equivalent to thousands or even millions of times brighter than the entire Milky Way galaxy. Light that's not just visible from across the universe, but that also doesn't really change much, which means that we've learned to use them as a kind of a beacon in order to navigate, or to be more specific, in order to use these objects in various navigation systems such as GPS. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. And today we're going to be talking about a recent study that might have solved one of the bigger mysteries in regards to ancient quasars. The mystery of how some of the first quasars in the universe might have been created and how they were able to exist, even though in theory it should not have been possible mostly because we don't believe such massive black holes should have existed in the early universe with such tremendous masses. But the actual observations show us that they did, and that there is something in there that we just don't understand. Yet this recent study might have solved this mystery. Well, let's actually discuss this in detail because it's a mystery that's been sort of in the making for several decades now. So what exactly is the mystery? Well, some of the earlier quasars were discovered over five decades ago, and back then they basically resembled a kind of a star-like object that weren't really truly stars but were still very bright. Because of this they were known as the quasi-stellar objects, abbreviated as QSO. Eventually this became Quasar. And with time the scientists figured out the theory behind this and how all of this worked, eventually realizing that this is basically the direct proof that black holes definitely exist and some of them can get super massive. And it was actually the early images from the Hubble Space Telescope that were finally able to pinpoint that a lot of these quasars are actually located in the center of various galaxies. And that means that the galaxies tend to produce quasars for the most part. With the culprit behind all of this being the central black hole in each of these galaxies. And eventually they even found some galaxies that were interacting or even merging with those quasars appearing much brighter. And this of course made a lot of sense, as the galaxies start to interact, a lot more mass comes into the center, and a lot of this mass then gets absorbed by the black hole, generating these quasars in the process. This actually pivots back to my point from the video I made about the James Webb telescope, that produced the image of these two interacting galaxies you see right here, and that we've discussed in that video, that from a certain angle, and of course during a certain period of time, would appear as quasars to someone really far away. More about this in that other video in the description or somewhere right there. And so over time, over a million different quasars have been discovered across the universe, 
with all of this so far making quite a lot of sense. But then something unusual started to happen in the early 2000s. The scientists also started to discover some of the earlier squeezers, with the current record holder being the quasar known as ULAS G1342 plus 0928, with many of these quasars also containing really, really massive black holes. In this particular case, it seems to be a black hole that's approximately 800 million masses of the Sun, or at least 200 times more massive than the one in the center of our own galaxy. And this sort of created a major problem, because current theories do not really explain how such a massive black hole can appear in such early universe. Today we know that when a typical black hole grows in size, it generally has two opposite forces acting in unison. There is a force pushing things out, as a lot of things are being emitted because of all of this radiation produced, this is what's known as the galactic wind, or in some cases it can also be known as the quasar wind. And then we obviously have the force of gravity from the black hole itself that tends to attract everything and tries to basically consume it to some extent. But because of the size of the black hole, which means that they're generally quite small, most of the mass does not get absorbed and ends up going through the rest of the galaxy and even escapes into the intergalactic space. And so there are actually limits on how fast a black hole can grow in size, and by using these limits we can determine that some black holes should not have been possible so early on. For example, this one here seems to have appeared in the universe only 690 million years after the beginning of the universe, meaning that somehow it managed to grow super fast and became super powerful already. And though maybe that one particular galaxy could have been a fluke, since then the scientists have found more. This one is at least 1.5 billion masses of the Sun, and was already around 700 million years after the beginning of the Big Bang. And this one is 1.6 billion masses of the Sun, and was around 670 million years after the beginning of the universe. And so this sort of created a problem for modern astronomy. And just as a side note, the most amount of emissions coming from various quasars around the universe, or basically the highest number of quasars in the universe, existed approximately 10 billion years ago, so basically before the solar system was even around. With time, the number of quasars decreased dramatically, and the size of black holes in all of these quasars ranged from several millions to tens of billions of solar masses. The more massive the black hole, the brighter the quasar, with some of the most powerful quasars releasing the amount of radiant energy thousands and thousands of times greater than the Milky Way itself. More intriguingly, some of the more recent studies have even identified groups of quasars that seem to create some of the largest known structures. You can actually see some of them in this list that you can also find in the description below. I think the biggest known today is the one known as Huge LQG, also known as Huge Large Quasar Group, containing 73 separate quasars that sort of look like this in the night skies. But because at least 200 quasars that are less than 1 billion years old have been discovered in the last couple of decades, nobody really understood how this was possible. But the scientists behind the recent study might have finally found an answer by basically asking a computer. They've conducted really complex and really important supercomputer calculations and simulations, showing us how all of this might have been created without the use of any special physics, without the need to change anything in our formula, and without breaking anything anywhere. And it all kind of makes sense. So first of all, today we know that normally quasars are found in these relatively large structures filled with a lot of turbulence and a lot of activity already, meaning that there's a lot of gas interacting and a lot of gas colliding with other gas, creating larger and larger structures. Now, one of the previous studies from a couple of years ago discovered that, well, for one, it's actually possible to create a relatively massive black hole pretty much directly, which can then essentially turn into a quasar, as long as everything here starts with a black hole that's approximately 100,000 masses of the Sun, meaning that it's possible to create all of this from a pre-existing, somewhat massive black hole. But the question was, how do you form these massive black holes when we know that black holes generally are produced during supernova and can grow in size maybe through collisions and maybe through absorbing mass, but we don't really know of any other mechanism. Maybe it was because of excess of radiation in certain regions, some unusual interaction of dark matter, or possibly some unusual gas interaction, or some other unusual interaction that we didn't understand, but that also was not observed in any of these early images where the quasars were clearly visible. So something else had to form these massive black holes right there from scratch. And all of this had to happen relatively fast, 
within maybe 250,000 years in order to form a massive black hole that could then start consuming mass and grow in size further. But this new supercomputer model essentially recreated some of the formations in the early universe, discovering that by just having enough cold gas that seems to coalesce into these very dense streams, this gas is then capable of growing into relatively massive black holes right there by itself in just a few hundred million years, without the need of anything unusual or anything exotic, with the only requirement in this case being turbulence, a lot of turbulence, turbulence that you can kind of see in this video. And so because of this hectic interaction of gas and a lot of streams moving around, smashing huge masses into other huge masses, at some point you actually get these relatively large chunks of mass visible in red that create overdensity. And this overdensity eventually collapses catastrophically, creating relatively massive black holes at least 40,000 masses of the Sun. In their simulation they created one with 30,000 and one with 40,000, which can then start growing bigger and bigger as they absorb more mass and interact with more gas and more matter around them. And so in a nutshell, what the idea here suggests is that pretty much everything here could be created in the early clouds these primordial clouds that existed in the early universe where just huge amounts of gas was violently interacting, forming larger and larger chunks, with some chunks eventually forming massive black holes. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a somewhat unusual discovery of a relatively nearby galaxy not so far away from the Milky Way that was actually discovered completely by accident not so long ago for one very unusual reason. For many decades prior to its discovery, it was actually hiding behind a relatively bright star. And so up until approximately two decades ago, the galaxy was completely invisible to some of the earlier astronomers. But because this particular star is moving really fast across the night skies, it eventually moved far enough to expose the galaxy behind it, allowing for some early observations and early analysis of exactly what this galaxy is. A galaxy that for now the scientists nicknamed Peekaboo, as in it was hiding, Peekaboo, now it's visible to us. Which is a pretty cute nickname, considering this galaxy was hiding from us for so long. With the actual name being High Pass J1131-31. And though the original discovery of this galaxy was already pretty incredible, extremely recently several scientists, using observatories like the Hubble telescope, were actually able to discover something else very unusual about this galaxy. Turns out, Peekaboo belongs to an extremely rare and extremely difficult to explain type of galaxies, whose origin is very mysterious and whose existence we actually cannot explain. And so let's discuss a little bit more about this galaxy and about the actual mystery of what's going on here. And the mystery here is really in regards to the evolution of galaxies and what we already know about galaxies like the Milky Way and a lot of galaxies near us and how we believe they evolve over time. Now based on a lot of observations from around the universe and especially based on observations from the Hubble telescope, today the scientists believe that various galaxies through collisions and through growth evolve from one type to another. But for the most part, pretty much all of the galaxies we can see around us today will usually have relatively similar features or at least relatively similar composition and what's known as metallicity. And so in this case, if we were to take a look at a galaxy not so far away from us, especially pretty much most of the galaxies within about 50 million light years away from us, we will discover that they mostly contain relatively similar metallicity, or they essentially contain relatively similar amount of hydrogen, helium, and much heavier elements, implying that most of them evolved around the same time and from pretty much the same material. And metallicity by itself is a pretty important feature to measure, because it can generally tell us a little bit more about the age of a certain object. So for example, many globular clusters located in the Milky Way galaxy will often have very similar metallicity, suggesting that many of them are at least 13 billion years old, with the objects existing in a universe much longer usually having higher metallicity, because essentially this object becomes enriched in a lot of different materials over time, with the majority of enrichment happening because of various supernova. As these supernova happen, they create a lot of heavier materials, which increase metallicity of the environment and the region around them. And so basically, if we find a star that has low metallicity in the Milky Way galaxy, it usually just means that the star is really old. However, if we look at the distant universe and find low metallicity objects there, it basically just means that we're looking at the extremely young part of the universe. But there is something unusual that was discovered about Peekaboo galaxy as well. 
It turns out to be a galaxy with one of the lowest values of metallicity. It's now defined as an extremely metal-poor dwarf galaxy, one of the lowest ever seen, which would be totally fine if this galaxy was really far away from us, and if we actually found this galaxy with, for example, James Webb Space Telescope, when looking at super distant parts of the universe. But that's not the case. This galaxy is one of the closest to us. It's within what's known as the local sheet, which is a shape formed by several nearby large galaxies within about 60 million light years away from us. But in this case, this galaxy is only about 22 million light years away from us. Located pretty close to the Milky Way and very likely being one of the satellites of NGC 3621, a relatively large spiral galaxy in the same location at approximately the same distance. But that's what makes this discovery so strange. It seems to be the only such object in the vicinity and there doesn't seem to be another galaxy with similar properties or more importantly with similar metallicity. All of the other galaxies in the region definitely are more similar in metallicity to the Milky Way, suggesting that all of them were created around the same time. Although compared to a lot of other galaxies, it is located in a low density environment potentially slightly away from that larger galaxy. But I guess that's really the main mystery. Where exactly did it come from and how exactly did it form? This is a type of a galaxy we expect to see billions of light years away from us in extremely early universe when the galaxies were just forming and just evolving. So could this low metallicity be explained in some other way? Maybe it's because it just has a bunch of old stars. Well, not really. It seems to contain a lot of young blue stars. As a matter of fact, the image itself shows this galaxy as very bright, very blue. So many of the stars here are very active and are producing a lot of energy. And they're definitely going to be going supernova as well. And it also does not seem to contain a lot of so-called red giant branch stars, which often indicate a galaxy or a globular cluster is on a slightly older side. And by doing a more thorough examination of approximately 60 separate stars in this galaxy, the scientists definitively confirmed that all of them are very hot, appear to be really young, but are also extremely low in metallicity, as if they were born not so long ago, possibly within the last 5 billion years, maybe even less than that. In other words, it implies that this galaxy is potentially even younger than the solar system itself. It didn't exist when the solar system was forming and suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Which is really, really strange because nobody can currently explain where exactly it came from and how it was created. And this is only one of most extremely metal poor galaxies known to us with unusual abundance of oxygen as well. The only other object that sort of resembles this galaxy is a galaxy known as Zwicky 18a, which was actually discovered nearly a hundred years ago, but was only identified to be unusual a few decades ago as well. This one is about 59 million light years away from us, but might have been created less than 1 billion years ago. Which of course adds to the mystery of these galaxies and how they formed. Did they actually suddenly appear out of nowhere because there was suddenly a lot of gas in the same space? Or, as some of the scientists implied, was this the result of a sudden appearance of matter as it's being guided by these really long tendrils made out of dark matter, with the dark matter then creating the galaxy by forcing all of the matter together in a very short period of time? At the moment there is really no explanation or solution to any of this, but discovering another one of these mysterious galaxies, recently confirmed to be the most extremely metal poor galaxy in the vicinity, could possibly help the scientists answer a lot of these questions in the next few years. And not just the questions of evolution of galaxies, but also possibly questions of evolution of everything in the universe. Discovering these strange galaxies that don't seem to fit the pattern is exactly how we are hopefully going to be able to solve these mysteries. By knowing how this formed, and by understanding the evolution of stars and matter in this galaxy, we're going to eventually find the answer to everything else. Today the scientists are quite familiar with a lot of different types of objects out there in the universe. With various types of galaxies, from really really small ones and practically invisible ones, to some really giant ones spanning millions of light years across, to more exotic objects such as quasars, and also various types of clusters such as galactic clusters or star clusters. Objects that in theory can contain millions and millions of stars. But apart from these very common types of systems and types of objects, it should not come as a surprise that there are probably some other objects and some other unusual structures that we still haven't discovered and still don't really understand. 
And today we're going to discuss one such unusual discovery from just a few days ago from the time when I'm making this video. A discovery of what seems to be either a new galactic type or a completely new type of a structure that represents a collection of new stars that's not really a galaxy, but also doesn't fit the definition of a globular cluster or any other cluster we've detected in the last few decades. But more importantly, it wasn't just one object, they've actually discovered five such objects, all possessing relatively similar features, but overall being relatively different in terms of the actual shape. Although all five of them are located in a relatively similar part of the universe, in a relatively similar part of space. So at the moment it's not entirely clear if this is a more widespread phenomenon existing everywhere in the universe, or if it only seems to have formed in this particular region. And I guess let's start with that. Where exactly was this found? Well, in this case, the scientists were actually trying to compile a kind of a catalog of different types of gas clouds and different types of galaxies in the vicinity of the Milky Way. And they were actually looking for potential sites of the formation of new galaxies within approximately several hundred million light years away from us. And so once the catalog became available, several scientists tried to find different locations of different types of new stars that could be associated with the formation of various brand new galaxies. And they did so by looking at a very specific spectrum that's only produced by very large, very massive and very powerful type B and type O blue stars that are generally produced in various fast growing systems with a lot of gas available for the formation of these brand new stars. They then usually go supernova, producing a huge cloud of gas that then results in the production of much smaller stars, very similar to our own sun. And generally that's what we believe happens in a lot of different clusters and also very likely happened in the beginning of the universe when early stars were forming and created all sorts of different galaxies that then combined into something larger. Although here the scientists have to be obviously careful. Some of the global clusters like this one right here will also contain certain blue stars. You can sort of see them inside. So just detecting them doesn't mean that this object is new. As you can see, the majority of stars here are orange. And this of course means that pretty much everything here is really, really ancient. Very likely billions and billions of years old. As a matter of fact, some of the oldest objects in our own galaxy are these global clusters. Some of them are almost as old as the universe itself. But there's one specific feature that makes these objects different from what was just discovered. And it's not just the type of stars. It's also the shape itself. A global cluster over time becomes a little bit more spherical, as you can see right here. But a brand new cluster, or a cluster that was created maybe a few million years ago, will not really be spherical at all. It's going to have a slightly more irregular shape, with way more blue stars and different types of bright stars, and very likely only a few orange stars inside of it. And so in this case, the cluster known as NGC 103 is obviously a lot younger. But interestingly enough, in this case, it's almost an entirely different story. The new stellar system seems to only contain blue stars. And it also obviously is very irregular in shape. With this one in particular being much longer than everything else. And that of course implies that this is a relatively new system, possibly only a few million years old. Which means that its location is really important. If this was discovered next to some kind of a galaxy, it means that this is just another cluster very likely formed by some of the gas that escaped the galaxy early on. But that's not the case here. This is actually located very far away from anything. The nearest galaxy is at least 300,000 light years away from here. And since several such objects were discovered, it only sort of adds to the mystery of their formation and to the mystery of the nature of these objects as well. The objects that currently don't really have a name, but one of them is referred to as SECO-1, also known as AGC-226067. And so at least for now, we're going to be calling these SECO objects. Sequel objects? I don't know. Anyway, the only thing the scientists are certain about is that they definitely represent some kind of a new object, or a new type of an object. But more importantly, because of their slightly different location in the night skies, they seem to represent the same phenomenon forming similar objects in very different parts of space. Actually, at least one of them might even be a smaller galaxy, but two of them seem to be connected to at least one galaxy, yet some other ones are not connected to anything at all. But in terms of the actual morphology, or in terms of the actual shape, and what's inside of these objects, they do seem to have very similar features. Resembling a kind of a blue blob, a few thousand light years across, very similar to a typical dwarf galaxy. With that object known as Psycho-1 being of particular interest, it does seem to represent a completely new class of objects. 
And though initially the scientists thought that maybe this is actually not so far away from us, by doing a more thorough calculation they discovered that this was in the cluster known as the Virgo Cluster. A very dense region with a lot of galaxies present in it, that's roughly around 50 million light years away from planet Earth, but contains up to 2000 different galaxies interacting, colliding, and as we've just discovered, potentially creating completely new objects. And our own galaxy, along with everything in it, is actually being dragged and pulled toward this particular cluster at a velocity of almost a thousand kilometers per second. And that's because of a huge mass present in the cluster, and also because of an unusual and somewhat mysterious location in the universe known as the Great Attractor. We've discussed this in some of the previous videos, and we'll be talking about this in some of the future videos as well, so make sure to subscribe if you'd like to learn more. And the center of this cluster is the famous M87 galaxy, with the center of all of this being the iconic picture we're all familiar with by now. But because this is such a packed neighborhood, as you can imagine, the interaction here does cause a lot of these galaxies to sort of start losing some of their gas. Now generally galaxies lose gas two different ways, either through the collision with other galaxies, or by using a process known as the REM pressure stripping, which usually happens when a galaxy full of gas enters a region that already has gas or has something else inside of it that's a little bit denser. And because of this, some of the gas from inside the galaxy ends up being pushed out or forced from the galaxy and then ends up creating invisible gas clouds in the intergalactic space. Here's for example a very well known spiral galaxy known as D100, where this beautiful tail is created by the ram pressure because of the motion of this galaxy through somewhat dense region that forces some of this gas out. And so some of this gas very likely then started to combine and form new stars that are now visible as these unusual objects that we're going to be calling seco objects. With one unusual feature of these objects also being the fact that this doesn't seem to contain a lot of atomic hydrogen gas. Atomic hydrogen is usually responsible for evolving into dense clouds, which then starts forming stars. And so the lack of atomic hydrogen, the presence of very large blue stars, and the lack of other stars, once again confirms that this is an entirely new type of an object never seen before anywhere else. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the discovery of what seems to be the largest galaxy out there, or at least the largest radio galaxy. The galaxy that you see right here in this image that the scientists are currently referring to as Alcyoneus, located around 3 billion light years away from us. But before I tell you a little bit more about this galaxy, let's first start with the idea of radio galaxies compared to some of the other large galaxies we know of. Now, first of all, as the name implies, radio galaxies are generally galaxies that tend to produce way more radio light than a lot of other galaxies near them. The best example here is the nearby Centaurus A. Now, this is sort of what it looks like if you were to combine various frequencies of light, but if you were to look at this galaxy in radio light alone, it would resemble a tremendously large structure that you see right here. We've discussed this in one of the previous videos somewhere right there or in the description below, but this thing right here is several times larger than the full moon in the night skies, stretching hundreds of thousands of light years across. But this structure is really only formed by the two astrophysical jets, very likely produced by the central black hole. And so all of this is formed by the black hole itself and can only be formed in so-called active galactic nuclei. But obviously, if you remove the jet and if you remove the activity, the galaxy then shrinks in size, or at least looks much smaller. As a matter of fact, most of these galaxies will appear as relatively small elliptical galaxies. So sort of like this. Elliptical galaxies are some of the more common galaxies out there, and generally speaking, even now we don't really have a really good way of measuring where these galaxies end mostly because they sort of slowly diffuse away, but some of them do have relatively large extended halos. And to date, the largest such galaxy, the largest elliptical galaxy, is the famous IC1101. The galaxy we've talked about many years ago, and a galaxy that literally dwarfs every other galaxy in the universe. This thing is at least 2 million light years across, at least uh, from the center to some of the outer regions of the halo, and is generally considered to be at least 40 times bigger than the Milky Way galaxy, possibly even more. But it's extremely difficult to define where this galaxy actually ends. We just know that it's just really, really, really big. If this right here is the Milky Way, 
This is the rough estimate of the size of IC 1101. But even 2 million light years is nothing compared to some of the radio galaxies, at least the jets created by these galaxies. Now, typically, a radio galaxy will always have the same features. It will be some sort of a central elliptical galaxy, there will be two jets in opposite directions, and it will always have a hot spot right here. Although the actual plumes can be slightly different depending on what's happening in the vicinity of the galaxy and what sort of mass distribution there is as well. Once again, a really good example is right here from Centaurus A. But some of the larger radio galaxies out there, especially the ones that have been studied for a long time, really sort of start blowing our minds, at least when it comes to size. So, for example, the iconic Hercules A galaxy you see right here is already almost the same size as the IC1101. This is nearly one and a half million light years across. And this is not even closest to being the biggest of these galaxies. This is actually one of the smaller ones. Although it did become popular because it's so easily observable and also because it has an extremely massive black hole in the center, at least 4 billion masses of the sun in mass. And in the last few years, scientists have discovered more and more of these unusual galaxies with one of the videos from last year that you can find right there or in the description describing a little bit more about this, with some of these galaxies reaching over 10 million light years across with many of these beautiful galaxies revealing their true size in just the last few years, simply because we've developed a lot of different, very powerful radio telescopes. This is, for example, a galaxy known as IC4296. Here are actually two examples from just the last year's study. Both of these galaxies are really large. The larger one is about 6.5 million light years across. That's more than three times larger than IC1101. But now we obviously have a new record holder. This is coming from this new study. So, located around 3 billion light years away from us, we have a galaxy stretching approximately 16.3 million light years across, over 8 times bigger than IC1101. And not only does this make it the largest galaxy and the largest radio galaxy, it also makes it one of the largest galactic structures to begin with. With the name Alcinius being the Greek name after the son of Uranus, the Greek god of the sky. This particular god was responsible for trying to fight Hercules for the entire supremacy of the cosmos, with this sculpture indicating that Hercules kind of won. But in the process of discovering this galaxy, the scientists were able to provide several answers about radio galaxies that we're going to discuss, with one major mystery that we still cannot answer being what exactly makes radio galaxies the way they are. In other words, why is it that only certain elliptical galaxies become these tremendously large structures? For example, why Hercules A? Why Centaurus A? Why not IC1101? And although we know that many galaxies do have radio lobes, including our own galaxy, whose radio lobes were discovered just a few years ago, you can see them in bluish-green color right here, there is still no clear explanation for why Centaurus A and other radio galaxies end up producing lobes that are just extremely large in comparison, very long, very powerful. And so the nature of these giant radio galaxies is not entirely understood. Now, at first the scientists thought that, well, maybe, it's all connected to the central black hole. The larger the black hole, the larger the lobes. But it doesn't really make sense, because galaxies like Hercules A seem to have lobes that are slightly below average in size, yet the black hole in the middle is one of the largest ever found. Likewise, Centaurus A has lobes that are pretty large, but the black hole in the center is not believed to be really massive at all, with the newly discovered Alcinius galaxy being somewhere in the middle. It's about 400 million masses of the Sun, or about 10 times less massive than the one in Hercules A, but obviously a lot more massive than the one in Centaurus A. So this particular logic of black holes being responsible for the length of lobes does not seem to make sense right now. It has to be some other reason. And some of the previous studies have suggested that maybe it's not really about what's inside the galaxy, not about the internal structure. Maybe it's actually about the environment where they're located, or about how these galaxies are positioned in regards to all of the other galaxies, and more importantly, in regards to the mysterious cosmic web and cosmic filament. The mysterious overdensity that forms these very beautiful patterns across the universe, where a lot of galaxies seem to be located. For example, the shape of plumes in this galaxy already suggests that just like the Milky Way, this galaxy is traveling inside the filament, where the gas inside the filament seems to be reshaping and changing the direction of some of these plumes. 
And because the galaxy itself seems to be a fairly normal elliptical galaxy that also seems to have an average mass of about 240 billion masses of the Sun, slightly less massive than the Milky Way galaxy, it suggests that whatever is happening inside the galaxy is definitely not responsible for the formation of the large plumes. The extremely large plumes are very likely formed by the interaction with the environment, especially since the mass here is so much lower than all of the other radio galaxies known to us. And so one suggestion here so far is that, well, maybe it only happens in regions of the galaxy where the overall density of material is much lower than it usually is. So maybe it's happening close to, for example, a typical void or some other under density, usually located not so far away from the filament. And moreover, these observations also point at the filament itself potentially being somehow responsible for the production of these really large jets and really large plumes. As a matter of fact, there seems to be some sort of a connection between the filament structure, the filament density, and also the size of the jets. It's still not clear what the actual connection is, but the answer in regards to the size of these jets seems to be more connected to the cosmic filament more so than the galaxy itself. Moreover, by studying the structure of these lobes and their interaction with the nearby material, it becomes possible to actually start probing some of the other secrets, including what's happening in the intergalactic medium, and potentially answer the questions about dark matter as well. But I guess even more shocking is that this particular galaxy is still growing in size. The plumes are slowly growing larger and they're actually moving away from the galaxy. And so this galaxy is going to remain the largest galaxy simply by growing bigger and bigger. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing one of the most fascinating nearby galaxies to us, the galaxy known as Centaurus A. And there's a really important reason for this. It's actually a recent image released by some of the Australian scientists. The image you see right here. But by itself, this doesn't really explain to you why this is fascinating. And that's because, well, to try to understand why this is fascinating, we have to imagine that we're able to see the radio waves. And so here, if you were to stand somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere, for example, in Australia, New Zealand, some parts of South America, and if you were to look into the night skies and try to actually see all of this in the radio light, this is what you would be seeing. And this is absolutely mind-blowing. The actual radio frequencies coming from this galaxy would be dramatically bigger than the full moon in the night skies with these formations themselves being millions of light years in length, but because of the proximity of this galaxy to the Milky Way, it essentially forms something that resembles this. And even though I was already convinced that Centaurus A is one of the most fascinating nearby galaxies, this image by itself once again blew my mind. And so let's discuss this galaxy and also discuss a little bit more about this discovery and what this shows us in regards to the events going on inside this particular galaxy right now. So first of all, when it comes to distances, it's still actually not clear how distant this galaxy is from the Milky Way. The current estimates suggest that it's anywhere from 10 to 16 million light years away from us, but because of the amount of activity on the inside, it becomes a little bit difficult to measure the exact distances, which usually employ various emissions from various types of variable stars. But generally, the average estimate here would be about 12 million light years. So this is what a lot of scientists usually assume when they do a lot of these measurements. And also, because it's so bright and so close to us, it's usually one of the best targets for amateur astronomy. But at the same time, because of this brightness, and also because of its unusual shape, it's very difficult to determine what sort of a galaxy this is. The scientists today are not sure if this is an elliptical galaxy, a spiral galaxy, or something in between. And for the first hundred years of its discovery since 1826, it actually wasn't even that interesting to scientists, mostly because back then nobody even knew about active galactic nuclei or black holes in the middle of galaxies, or actually that these were even galaxies. They were believed to be different nebula, potentially different planets. But at the same time, once the scientists realized what sort of a galaxy this was, they also realized how incredibly special this galaxy was. This is the closest active radio galaxy to us with a very active galactic nucleus on the inside that produces a tremendous amount of radiation and obviously a tremendous amount of energy that's being released through these two astrophysical jets pointed away from the black hole 
and the material here is believed to be released at approximately half the speed of light, but it does slow down with time, and the recent discovery from the recent study suggests that a lot of this radio material farther away from the galaxy moves at a speed of about 1000 km per second. But because of its unusual shape that seems to be either elliptical or potentially spiral in shape, and also because of its active nucleus, it's sort of been assumed that this was probably a result of a collision between a spiral galaxy and a collision between an elliptical galaxy. And this resulted in this iconic shape of the galaxy that we're observing from planet Earth. And based on the current calculations of the mass of the central black hole, it suggested that the mass here is at least 10 times more massive than the one in our own galaxy. So here it's about 55 million masses of the Sun. And all of this activity first produces a lot of radio light, but also ends up producing some of the X-rays visible from farther distances away from the central black hole. And although the X-ray jets here are several thousand light years long, the radio jets end up producing something that's thousands of times longer, at least a million light years in length. And there also seems to be quite a lot of different star formation activity, which once again reinforces the idea that this is a result of a galactic collision. So for example, even though the center, the bulge of the galaxy, seems to be composed of mainly really old red stars, the disk surrounding it is for the most part uh, showing the signs of recent star formation. There are quite a lot of different star formation regions here, and they're sort of visible as tiny pink dots in this video. There are over a hundred of them in this video, and there are over a hundred such regions in Centaurus A galaxy. As a matter of fact, there were at least two different supernova in the last few decades here, so this is a pretty active galaxy in terms of star formation as well. And a few months ago, the iconic Event Horizon Telescope team released an image from this galaxy showing us what's happening right near the center of the black hole. Essentially showing us how the jet evolves really, really close to the black hole and how it seems to possess very specific structures. And you can learn more about this by watching one of the older videos that should be popping up somewhere right there at some point. And so essentially this is a pretty exciting galaxy to study, even though unfortunately you can mostly only see it from the southern hemisphere or from some of the low regions in the northern hemisphere at a very specific time during nighttime. But once again, this new image created by the scientists using Australian radio telescopes, it takes it to a completely new level. Here we're looking at the most detailed radio emission image ever produced coming from one of the nearest supermassive black holes to planet Earth with each of these bubbles produced by the supermassive black hole being at least a few hundred million years old. But once again, if you were to imagine this in radio waves, that's essentially when it becomes mind-blowing. It's the size of approximately 16 full moons. And a lot of this was not actually visible to us simply because, well, first of all, these are extremely difficult to see because of the noise, radio noise coming from a lot of sources on planet Earth, but also because the jets themselves are just extremely bright. So seeing the farther details here or seeing the bubbles on the outskirts becomes just very, very difficult. And to study all of this, the scientists used the radio telescope that sort of looks like this. There are 256 of these sets in this region spread over a large area that's several square kilometers in size. The telescope that's usually referred to as the Murchison Whitefield Array. And so because of the sensitivity of this telescope, alone with its location in an extremely radio quiet zone, it allowed the scientists to produce this paper that essentially studies the effects from these jets. And specifically focusing on the radio emissions, confirming one of the interesting ideas in regards to how these black holes are actually fed, and what happens when these jets interact with some of the gas around the galaxy. Today this idea is referred to as the chaotic cold accretion, and it refers to the idea behind how these black holes are fed. Essentially here, the cold gas that's usually condensed in the galactic halo then ends up slowly moving toward the center of the galaxy, with all of this condensed gas moving closer to the central black hole, which then ends up feeding the black hole, which then produces the jets and releases more gas to the outskirts. With the jets then inflating further and spreading this gas across a very large area around the galaxy, around the galactic halo, which then sort of restarts the cycle again as all of this gas starts to condense and moves closer to the central black hole. So this feedback mechanism is what the scientists believe feeds the black hole and what the scientists believe we're observing in this radio image produced by MWA. And it seems that a lot of charged particles here are very likely re-accelerated and are essentially interacting with strong magnetic fields present in this region. That's essentially what's producing these radio waves. 
and the material right here moves at a speed of about 1100 kilometers per second and approximately three masses of the sun of this material is being released from the central black hole every single year. Here's actually another image that was produced by the scientists and this is a composite image showing us some of the radio plasma that's seen in blue and you can see there's quite a lot of it. Also x-rays that are visible in orange and large amounts of cold neutral hydrogen that's visible in purple. Suggesting of course that there's quite a lot of various interaction, quite a lot of re-acceleration of matter away from the black hole and some of this matter then ends up falling back into the black hole, feeding it once again. In the last few years, the scientists have made some really incredible discoveries about our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Discoveries that really redefined our understanding of what our galaxy looks like. And so even though we kind of assume that the galaxy might resemble something like this, the reality is a lot more complicated. First of all, it seems to be kind of warped. It also has all of these unusual streams around it. It has a very large halo that's also slanted as well and possesses a lot of other features such as globular clusters present all over the place. With all of this discussed in some of the previous videos you can find in the description. But more unusual features become apparent if you start observing the galaxy in other frequencies, for example radio frequencies, infrared light, or even x-ray and gamma ray light that obviously our eyes cannot see, which obviously transforms the galaxy even more. So here's the visible light, here are some of the older observations in the x-rays, the gamma rays, the infrared light, microwave light, and of course radio light as well. But these observations are on a slightly older side. A lot of newer observations started to discover some really incredible features that even today we have trouble explaining. And today we're going to be discussing one of these features, unusual stream-like formations or unusual filaments that seem to be present in the Milky Way itself but also seem to be present outside of the galaxy and obviously in other galaxies as seen by various other telescopes. And here we're talking about these very strange filaments we discussed in one of the previous videos, once again in the description below, that kind of become apparent if you look at the galaxy by observing it in radio frequencies. Filaments that stretch for at least several light years and that seem to propagate throughout the galaxy and seem to be located in a lot of different regions. Although predominantly they seem to be associated with a lot of ancient supernova or regions with a lot of molecular gas that might possess quite a lot of magnetic energy which the scientists believe creates these unusual phenomena. And so in some sense these are believed to be magnetic filaments, potentially related to a much smaller phenomenon of solar filaments we observe on the surface of the sun that is magnetic in nature, but also obviously may be formed in some entirely different way we still don't understand. And intriguingly the scientists behind this recent paper have actually originally discovered the first filament back in the 1980s, pretty much four decades ago. Only a small one was seen at first, but more and more started to be discovered as our telescopes became better. And today over a thousand filaments have already been discovered all across the Milky Way galaxy, with some of them stretching all the way up to 150 light years in length, with some of the longest ones being located very close to the center of the galaxy. But the recent paper focused on something slightly different, discovering similar filaments in other galaxies, such as this distant radio galaxy that has somewhat similar filaments formed by the massive black hole in the middle, with several other similar filaments discovered in some other galaxies, but intriguingly all of them being dramatically longer than anything in the Milky Way. For example this one right here is over 300 light years in length, several times longer than a typical filament in the Milky Way galaxy. And although many of them do seem to resemble the ones we've discovered in the Milky Way as well, such as the one on the right, in terms of the sheer size they're just dramatically larger. As you can see the one on the left is approximately 3000 times longer even though it possesses a relatively similar shape. Here is another comparable image between the Milky Way on the bottom, an object referred to as Feather, and another object 25,000 times larger located in a distant galaxy, but with somewhat similar features. But in most cases a lot of these observations came from very active, very massive radio galaxies with really powerful black holes in the center. Although because of the similarity in structure, it might actually appear as if it was created by a relatively similar type of phenomenon. And so the underlying physical mechanism could be generally the same. But unlike the filaments in the Milky Way galaxy, are only visible because first of all they're much larger, but they also seem to be much much older, very likely existing for millions or even billions of years. Although a lot of newly discovered filaments mostly seem to be part of a large galactic cluster 
that contains thousands of different galaxies interacting with one another approximately 1 billion light years away from planet Earth. But it's the radio galaxies within the cluster that seem to be forming a lot of these filaments. Although despite being very likely more powerful and much larger, their overall magnetic field is much weaker as well, at least 1000 times weaker than what we actually observe here in the Milky Way. And also, unlike the variety of filaments in the Milky Way galaxy, the majority of extragalactic filaments seem to be mostly at 90 degree angle from the black hole jets that usually look something like this. Which means that they create a kind of an unusual shape that's I think better visible right here. And this particular feature is obviously kind of difficult to explain right now. But because the overall shape is very similar to what we see in the Milky Way, and because even the length to width ratio is exactly the same, the overall mechanism responsible for their production is believed to be the same as well. Or at least extremely similar. For example, as seen in this filament, it seems to possess more energy closer to its origin, and in this case it's closer to the jet from the black hole, but starts to lose energy as it travels farther down, eventually disappearing into nothingness. And in both cases, it's not entirely clear where all of this originates. For example, for the radio galaxy, it's assumed that the jet provides the initial energy, with the filament then moving on its own path and losing the energy in the process. But what exactly makes these filaments so long and allows them to accelerate for such a long distance is still not entirely clear. I mean, for example, here you're looking at something that's over 150,000 light years in length. That's basically the size of our own galaxy. More intriguingly, this seems to be formed by electrons traveling along the magnetic lines. And because they don't travel at the speed of light, it means that for some of these objects, these electrons travel for 100 or even 500,000 years before they finally disappear. In some cases, this can be up to a million years. And what exactly allows them to travel for so long without breaking apart is of course unknown. Now, one potential explanation here is, well, maybe all of this comes from the motion of the galaxy itself. As the galaxy rotates, it might create a comet-like tail behind it, essentially forming these unusual filaments. The interaction between the motion of the galactic edge and the stuff between galaxies maybe creates some of these filaments in the process. Or the other explanation could be related to some kind of a turbulence inside a relatively weak magnetic field. As various galaxies inside the cluster move around, the resulting interaction can start creating various vortices and a lot of motion on the inside. And as the weak magnetic field starts to wrap around these disturbances, it can get stretched, folded and amplified, with time resulting in the variety of different filament-like structures with relatively strong magnetic field inside of them. At least that's one of the two explanations the scientists propose right now, although the reality is that we still actually have no idea how many of these are formed. And more realistically, we actually have no idea if the ones inside the Milky Way, despite their similarity, have anything in common with the ones outside of the Milky Way, or if these are actually completely different phenomena despite their similarity in shape. Now, it's most likely that these are magnetic in nature, and very likely are the result of something extremely powerful, such as a supernova producing these over time, but there's also a chance that many of these are created by different events that actually result in similar observations. Okay. It's only been a few days since I made the last video, about the most distant galaxy ever. The galaxy that you see as a tiny red blob in this image, and that the scientists currently refer to as Glass Z13. With Z13 representing the distance to this galaxy. But now, only a few days later, there's quite a lot of chatter on Twitter. And I sort of joined in on the chatter, because there are these two new papers, or possibly even more than two, that might have discovered something even more unusual something even more extreme. And of course, something that was discovered in the new data provided by the wonderful James Webb Telescope. So, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to discuss this absolutely incredible new discovery that's still extremely preliminary, but could fundamentally change the way we see the universe, or at least the way we see the early universe when the early stars and the early galaxies started forming. Because a lot of this new data suggests that we might actually have underestimated the age by which the galaxies have already formed and also underestimated the age when the early stars formed as well. With these new studies suggesting that many of these stars might have formed much much earlier or maybe there's just something that we don't really understand about the early universe and something we're going to be learning from the James Webb Telescope. 
Either way though, these new discoveries are sort of, at least at this point, controversial. And mostly because they sort of contradict a lot of the early predictions and a lot of modern understanding when it comes to the evolution of the universe in general. But I guess before I start, a huge side note. All of this is still very preliminary and has not been peer reviewed. And more importantly, some of these studies might have actually misread certain galaxies as being more distant than they actually are. In other words, it will probably take a few months before all of this is officially confirmed or before we can actually understand what's going on here. Anyway, let's start with the basics. So up to about this point, which is just about 1 billion years after the formation of the universe, we kind of have no problems. We understand that at this point, the so-called Dark Ages were finished, and that's essentially when all of these stars and galaxies in the universe produced so much ultraviolet light that it sort of changed a lot of neutral hydrogen into ionized hydrogen, while at the same time allowing a lot of starlight to go through the universe without being absorbed by anything. But before that, because of the presence of neutral hydrogen, a lot of the starlight and a lot of light coming from various galaxies was essentially absorbed by this neutral hydrogen and to some extent was invisible to us. And because of this, it's sort of referred to as the Dark Ages. Whereas the first light formed approximately 375,000 years after the formation of the universe, and that's the iconic cosmic microwave background that's essentially visible in radio light and represents the first light when the first atoms started forming. But in between these two dates, there is a little bit of uncertainty. Actually, now there is a lot of uncertainty. First of all, it's not entirely understood when the first stars formed and when the stars started forming galaxies, also why they started doing so, and what led them to form more complex structures. A lot of modern ideas suggest that it's maybe something to do with the very mysterious and somewhat difficult to see cosmic web that you see right here a kind of a structure that seems to be all over the universe and very likely is composed of a lot of gas, some stars, a lot of galaxies, and most likely a lot of dark matter, if of course it exists. But the actual web does exist and has been seen several times. But in order to answer some of these questions, the scientists really wanted to see some of these early galaxies and more importantly discover some of the early stars. They're usually referred to as population 3 stars and essentially represent the stars only made out of hydrogen and helium, nothing else. That's very different from our own sun. Our sun contains quite a lot of different elements on the inside. And that's of course where James Webb comes in. It was supposed to be really good at finding all of this because of its ability to see the infrared light. And infrared light in this case is very important because at these distances, all of the original ultraviolet light from all of these very powerful stars has actually been redshifted into very specific infrared frequencies. And some of these frequencies Hubble was able to detect as well. But because of the frequencies that Hubble could see, its limit was set at approximately 400 million years after the beginning of the universe. Whereas as you can see from this image, Webb can see much much farther. In more scientific terms, for the Hubble telescope, the limit was the redshift of 11, or Z of 11. With the galaxy you see right here, known as GNZ11, being the most distant galaxy Hubble has ever discovered. This represents approximately 420 million years after the formation of the universe. For James Webb telescope, the near cam can extend to approximately 5 microns of infrared light, which represents the age of the universe when it was less than 50 million years old. And a super quick side note, at these super far away distances, using the actual distance, which would be in billions of light years, or actually over 30 billion light years, it sort of makes it redundant and somewhat difficult to understand. And so because of this, the scientists usually use the idea of redshift. In one of the previous videos, I showed you this pretty good calculator that allows you to calculate all of this pretty quickly, the redshift calculator by Edward Wright. And so here, by calculating the redshift of 11, we can discover that the universe was only about 419 million years old, and the distance here was about 32.1 billion light years away from us, with the light traveling for 13.3 billion years, which transformed any ultraviolet light into infrared light that we can see with James Webb. And so last week, we talked about this new discovery of the galaxy Glass Z13 with the redshift of 13, which at that point was the most likely record holder. In this case, the redshift of 13 gives us the age of about 330 million years. But these two new papers were able to discover a bunch of more objects. With both of these papers focusing on the iconic first image 
of the galactic cluster SMAX 0723-73, the image that we were shown a few weeks ago. Here's by the way what it looked like with the Hubble telescope. Now as you might already know, this cluster is also gravitationally lensed. You can obviously see it from the unusual warping of the galaxies. And this lens allows the scientists to see much farther than would be otherwise possible. And so the scientists actually analyzed the raw data from all of the observations of this cluster, with two teams identifying several dozen of new objects, with some potentially being new record holders. And here it's important to highlight the word potentially. These are still very preliminary discoveries and definitely need to be looked at by other scientists. And so in this first paper, the scientists were able to discover 55 highly redshifted galaxies and 44 of them seem to be entirely new. But more importantly, 6 of them were at the redshift of over 12 and one of them was at the redshift of 16.7. Which, if confirmed, would make it the new record holder. This would be a galaxy that's just over 230 million years old at a distance of almost 35 billion light years away from us. And in order to discover these ancient galaxies, the scientists basically have to look for objects that aren't actually visible at shorter infrared wavelengths, but are visible at certain other wavelengths. Which would imply that some of this neutral hydrogen absorbed the ultraviolet light coming from the early stars, but would then allow other light to pass through. And so if they actually discover objects that have these properties, it generally indicates that these must be ancient galaxies that existed during the Dark Ages. Although interestingly enough, a lot of these galaxies discovered so far seem to have a lot of mass in them already, possibly billions of masses of the sun of material with a lot of really massive stars on the inside. Which was already a surprise because nobody expected to have these very massive galaxies in such early universe. And then we have this second paper that identified 88 candidates. But interestingly enough, at least one of their candidates is at the redshift of 20. And that's when the universe was only 180 million years old, representing the distance of nearly 36 billion light years away from us. Which of course suggests that the stars very likely existed even before that. And that's of course completely unexpected, especially because these are very preliminary observations and very very preliminary results. It means that within just a few years we're going to be finding even more records of even more distant objects out there. I'm always super excited to talk about various amateur discoveries in astronomy, specifically discoveries that are done completely by accident and discoveries that were somehow missed by professional astronomers for one reason or another. And in this case, it's a discovery of an unusual new galaxy, a never before seen galaxy that seems to be orbiting the iconic Andromeda at a distance of about two and a half million light years away from us. But it's not this galaxy, that's obviously the Andromeda. It's a galaxy that you can sort of see right here, but where is it? Where is the actual galaxy? And that's essentially where I guess we start our story. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the discovery of Pegasus 5. Or maybe it's Pegasus V. No, I think it's 5. A dwarf galaxy that's sort of visible in this picture right here, but becomes a little bit more obvious once you're shown where it's located. And this is a very unusual ultra-faint dwarf galaxy located somewhere at the edge of the Andromeda, that was recently identified by one of the amateur astronomers by using the publicly available data from the National Science Foundation's NOAA lab, the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, the publicly funded research center that's been getting so much better at both sharing its data and also at science communication. And in this case discovered by the Italian amateur astronomer Giuseppe Donatello. I'm sorry, I totally mispronounced that. Anyway, the astronomer that's already discovered six other galaxies before and who also has some really incredible astrophotography pictures available on the website you can find in the description. But very recently, while looking around at this public data that's available for pretty much everyone to peruse, he accidentally came upon this unusual smudge, as he called it. The smudge that sort of everyone missed. And this turned out to be this unusual hiding dwarf galaxy. The galaxy that we now refer to as Pegasus V, or Pegasus 5. In this case, this was part of so-called DESI Legacy Imaging Survey image. You can access this in the link in the description. And it includes this interactive map that you can use to explore pretty much everything out there. Although unless you have a lot of experience doing this, it would be very difficult to find something here that seems to be out of place. For the most part, pretty much all of these objects are already known to us. But obviously there are still some objects that are hiding in pretty much plain view. 
As a matter of fact, only a few years ago, we've talked about one of these objects right here in the Milky Way galaxy, or technically around the Milky Way galaxy. And specifically, it was a very similar dwarf galaxy, or what's known as the Diffuse Dwarf Galaxy. And there are quite a lot of these that have been found around the Milky Way in the last few years. There are over 60 different dwarf galaxies in the orbit around the Milky Way, with one of the most recently discovered being Centaurus 1, but as you can see from this table, quite a few of them have been found in the last 5 years or so. And so obviously more of these will be found in the next few years as more and more telescopes become operational and as our technology improves as well. Similarly, quite a lot of satellites on the Andromeda are already known as well, but only some of them have been discovered relatively recently. As a matter of fact, the last major discovery from the Andromeda previously was approximately 10 years ago. And that's obviously because, first of all, it's much farther away, but also because, well, these galaxies are just generally very, very difficult to see. And there's a very good reason for this. They're known as diffuse galaxies because they don't contain a lot of bright stars. Any stars that are present here are just very, very dim, much dimmer than our own sun. And that's because many of these stars are just really, really, really old, way past their prime. Some of them are billions of years old, and many of them are what's known as red dwarfs. And many of the bright stars that used to exist here either went supernova a long, long time ago, or might have been captured by the Andromeda itself. But in this particular case, it wasn't really until the follow-up that it was officially determined that this is indeed a galaxy, and it's indeed a very dim galaxy. In this case, this was done by the 8-meter Gemini North Telescope that used some of its state-of-the-art technology to confirm the existence of this dwarf galaxy but in the process also determined that this galaxy seems to be extremely low in heavier elements compared to any other dwarf galaxy we found in the vicinity. And what this implies is that this is an extremely ancient galaxy, very likely a galaxy that existed even before the Andromeda and the Milky Way started to form into larger galaxies that they are today. In other words, this here seems to be some kind of a primordial, really ancient galaxy, potentially even a galaxy that existed very likely almost as long as some of the oldest stars in the universe. And we know this because this galaxy seems to mostly contain only hydrogen and helium, and does not contain a lot of heavier elements such as carbon, nitrogen or oxygen. Making this a kind of a fossil galaxy, one of the first galaxies that very likely formed in the vicinity of the Andromeda and the Milky Way, and one of the galactic relics that very likely contains a lot of information about some of the earliest stars in the universe. It might even contain some of the oldest stars we'll ever discover, but this might be very difficult to find because of the distance and because of the low luminosity. But theoretically, so many more of these galaxies, these relatively hard to see galaxies, should be in orbit around both the Milky Way and the Andromeda even right now. The problem is that we don't seem to see them, and if they don't exist, it might actually create a bit of a problem for the modern cosmology. Specifically, the problems for the ideas behind the mysterious dark matter. But it's not a problem we're going to be solving anytime soon. But in this case, what's interesting is how all of this was discovered. First of all, it was discovered using public data. Second of all, it was discovered by an amateur astronomer. But third of all, it was discovered using a telescope and a survey that was never meant to discover any of this. So it was basically as accidental as it can get. But because of this discovery, by using the Gemini 8 meter mirror, they were then able to identify certain very, very old, somewhat faint stars, which then allowed the scientists to directly measure the distance to this galaxy, and also determine its stellar population, which they discovered to be extremely old. So basically, there are still quite a lot of stars out here, millions and billions of different stars, but everything here is super ancient. As a matter of fact, this is probably what most of the galaxies are going to look like billions of years in the future when they no longer have any gas or can produce bright stars. And although it's kind of hard to tell it from this picture, the analysis in this case did determine that there is a huge concentration of really old stars in here. But unlike a lot of other galaxies we've discovered in the last few decades, this one seems to have seized its star activity and star formation an extremely long time ago. We're talking about billions and billions of years ago very likely even before the existence of the solar system and planet Earth. But in this case, the scientists believe that this is maybe the fossil of some of the first galaxies that existed in our area. In other words, it's maybe some kind of a leftover from some of the galactic collision that used to happen here in the beginning of the universe. And so in that sense, it might actually help us understand how Andromeda and the Milky Way formed, but also help us get closer to solving the mystery of the mysterious dark matter. 
As a matter of fact, it's believed that this particular galaxy was formed during the period known as the reionization period, something we've talked about on the channel previously, and something that the scientists are trying to learn more about because it's a period the scientists want to learn more about as it involves the creation of early stars. And at the same time, this might also help us solve the mystery of the satellite galaxies of the Andromeda itself. As the scientists started to discover more and more satellites of the Andromeda, and specifically some of the dimmer ones, they discovered that many of them seem to have a very unusual orientation orbiting in a kind of a polar plane in relation to the Andromeda itself. And this is kind of unexpected, because mathematically we think that they should be randomly distributed. But they're not. They do have this unusual polar distribution, and at the moment it doesn't really make sense. There are a lot of unique and unusual galaxies out there in the universe, but in this video we're actually going to be discussing some, if not the most unique ones we've discovered so far. A type of a galaxy that looks very different from anything else we've ever seen before, and that even today is somewhat difficult to explain in terms of its origins. With the recent study you can find in the description below, now discovering a new member. This is known as a polar rain galaxy. An unusual type of a galaxy where the outer ring of gas and also the outer ring of stars doesn't actually orbit in the same direction or even in the same plane as the rest of the galaxy. With this one right here known as NGC 660 being one of the more popular examples. Although here it's not a true polar galaxy because there is a bit of an angle between the galaxy and the ring itself. And a slightly better example being this galaxy known as the Helix also known as NGC 2685 where you can kind of see that the plane and the ring itself are kind of perpendicular to one another. Something that in terms of the galactic formation is not particularly easy to explain. Most of the simulations that have been run when galaxies are created generally don't produce these effects. They generally produce regular spiral galaxies or sometimes elliptical galaxies or anything in between. So how exactly are the polar galaxies supposed to form here then? Here's actually another beautiful example of a galaxy known as NGC 5266. Although in this case I guess it's a little bit difficult to tell that this is a polar galaxy because the central galaxy is more or less elliptical. But objects like this kind of give us a hint on how all of this is created. So first of all, all of the known polar galaxies are generally documented in what's known as SPRC, Sloan Digital Sky Survey of Polar Ring Galaxies. And currently it contains 275 candidates, with only 70 being best candidates, Suggesting that these types of galaxies are actually exceptionally rare. Out of nearly 2 trillion galaxies in the observable universe, we seem to only have 275 polar galaxies. Which obviously means that discovering a new one is a huge deal. But I guess what makes all of them kind of similar is that apart from the ring, in their center they tend to contain what's known as the lenticular galaxy. It's sort of a galaxy that's not truly elliptical, but that's also not truly a disk shape either. In other words, it's not a spiral, it's not an elliptical galaxy, it's something in between. And today is believed that pretty much all of them are a result of some kind of a major collision between two galaxies. Although their true formation origin is still being debated even today. But in these polar ring galaxies, the lenticular galaxy is surrounded by a ring that's in almost perpendicular location. But more importantly, it stays separate from the galaxy for billions of years. In other words, this remains as a stable structure, possibly even a permanent structure. Now so far approximately 400 candidates have been discovered to date, but only a few of them, or actually more like a dozen, have been officially confirmed. And so obviously to try to explain their origin and to try to explain exactly what's happening here and how they're formed, the scientists need to find more examples and potentially more in-between examples in order to potentially discover their origin and their formation story. And that's precisely what the Japanese scientists behind the study wanted to do, by using one of the Japanese telescopes known as Subaru. They essentially focused on trying to discover more polar galaxies using some of the recent surveys. And they found one very good candidate. And to me personally, it was actually really surprising that it was just one. It really highlights how extremely rare these galaxies are. Currently they refer to it as G0953, a galaxy that seems to be located pretty much at the edge of the survey they used. Cosmic Evolution Survey, a survey that employed several telescopes, including Subaru, but also including the Hubble Space Telescope. And naturally the survey that already discovered quite a lot of interesting discoveries. But interestingly, this galaxy was originally found back in the original release from the survey, 
back in the year 2000, so like 22 years ago. But it wasn't until now that the scientists were able to realize that this is not just any galaxy, but a very unique polar galaxy. A galaxy that's about 39 billion solar masses, and is also forming stars at the rate of 2.6 solar masses per year. But if we were to look at it slightly closer, it might actually resemble this right here, NGC 4650A. One of the few polar galaxies that have been actively studied in the last few years. And so in this case, as you can see, a lot of this mass is distributed both in the ring and in the central disk. And so similarly, approximately one-fifth of all of the mass in this galaxy is in the polar ring, whereas about 26 billion solar masses are in the central disk, with the ring in this case being roughly around two and a half times bigger than the central disk. But what makes this discovery particularly unusual is of course the position itself. You can sort of see in this image that it almost looks like a cross. And that's because, like in similar examples I showed you, this is an almost perpendicular ring and has rarely been observed in other galaxies. More importantly, it seems to be almost perfect in its shape and doesn't seem to possess any disturbed features, suggesting that it was produced a long time ago. But from this observation, the scientists also are pretty certain that the disk itself is much younger than the galaxy because it seems to be a little bit bluer. And the central galaxy is very likely a disk, potentially similar to other lenticular galaxies like NGC 2787. But because no additional observations have been made so far, and the scientists haven't even measured the redshift, we don't even know how far away and specifically how big this galaxy currently is. For all we know, this could be super far away and super big. Or maybe it's much closer to us and thus much smaller. But it's galaxies like this, galaxies that have a relatively permanent and relatively old ring around them, that may actually finally help us understand how all of this forms. For example, if this is a result of some kind of a galactic passage or galactic collision, as currently believed by many scientists, it's quite possible that in some collisions, instead of combining into one large galaxy, some galaxies end up stripping a large amount of material from the other galaxy, turns the galaxy into the lenticular galaxy, but then also ends up forming a relatively large disk that's essentially in the polar orbit. With the main difference here being the angle of approach. If the smaller galaxy approaches from a relatively perpendicular position, it might essentially end up losing a lot of its mass, with the mass then assuming a ring-like formation. With some studies suggesting that a small fraction of lenticular galaxies that have smaller galaxies approach them from either the top or the bottom, eventually forming these rings or some kind of a similar formation over time, with the estimates suggesting approximately half a percent of all lenticular galaxies. But that's of course just one of the explanations that currently unfortunately does not have much proof. A much more convincing explanation is unfortunately the explanation we currently do not have. But by studying galaxies like this, and specifically by looking at various gas features and various star formation features using telescopes like the James Webb, and also trying to establish the timeline for the formation of some of this gas and some of these stars, with time we can definitely work out how all of this works and how these unusual polar ring galaxies are actually formed. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the recent discoveries in regards to the more unusual galaxies that we kind of think might not possess any dark matter. The mysterious phenomenon we still don't really understand very well, but the phenomenon that seems to be out there. And to be more specific, we're talking about these very iconic galaxies, which are kind of barely even visible here. This one is known as NGC 1052-DF2 that in the past few years created a lot of problems for a lot of different cosmologists. First of all, compared to a lot of other galaxies of the same type, the diffuse galaxies DF2 and DF4 seem to possess pretty much nothing on the inside, only a few stars and only some gas, no dark matter whatsoever. Which creates a few problems for the scientists, but I guess the biggest problem is that nobody can explain how this happened. But more importantly, it invalidates various alternative explanations in regards to the idea of dark matter. But now we have this very new study that seems to go even further and discovers something else really intriguing. So let's talk about these discoveries, what all of this means, and more importantly, where we're most likely headed in the future. But let's start with a very important side note. At the moment, nobody knows what dark matter is. Nobody knows if it's actual matter, nobody knows if it's just a phenomenon or some kind of a misinterpretation in our observations. And up until this point, there was no good explanation for how certain galaxies seem to possess none of it. 
But there is dark matter phenomenon nevertheless. It's been observed from a lot of different things around the universe. From motion of the stars around galaxies, to various dilation effects that cannot be explained otherwise, to a lot of other unusual mass observations which can really only be explained as some invisible matter hiding between various galactic clusters. In other words, it seems to be there, but maybe it's not. Maybe it is due to our misunderstanding of how gravity formula work. For example, MOND or Modified Newtonian Dynamics tries to explain all of this by slightly changing the Newtonian gravity formula. And it seems to apply to some objects, for example, some motion of stars and different other objects in different galaxies, but the existence of galaxies with no dark matter creates a huge problem for this particular idea. Galaxies like this imply that MOND might be incorrect. And because of this, there's been a kind of a long discussion now between scientists supporting MOND and scientists supporting the dark matter theory, where some scientists have suggested that maybe we just miscalculated the distance to these different galaxies, and they're actually much closer to us, with motion appearing differently. And another recent study has even suggested that certain galaxies that seem to possess no dark matter could maybe just be observed from a very different angle. Instead of looking at them face on, we might be just looking at them from a slightly shifted angle where motion appears differently. Oh, and by the way, quick clarification, when we're talking about motion, in this case, the scientists are actually measuring the motion of different global clusters that are orbiting around these galaxies. These objects are pretty bright and they're quite easily visible from millions of light years away from us, so that's what they're really talking about. Although in some cases, they also measure the motion of the actual dust inside the galaxies, but usually it's global clusters. But more importantly, a lot of astronomers today believe that galaxies cannot form without some kind of a presence of dark matter. As a matter of fact, dark matter is believed to be the foundation for the formation of galaxies in the, what you are observing right here, in the cosmic web. And so it's the cosmic web in this case that's responsible for more or less creating the galaxies we're observing across the universe. And the cosmic web seems to be produced by the mysterious dark matter. At least that's one of the most accepted explanations. But when the scientists discovered DF2 and DF4, which seemed to be relatively close to one another, this was kind of strange. And so here, the scientists behind the original discovery started to speculate, maybe there's actually more. Maybe there's an entire trail of these unusual galaxies, which might have been created in a very unique way. Moreover, when it comes to the type of these galaxies, there are already so many unanswered questions. So these galaxies are generally known as the ultra-diffuse galaxies, or UDGs for short. Unlike a typical dwarf galaxy like this one right here, known as Small Magellanic Cloud, a typical UDG is defined by an extremely low brightness. Mostly because there are not a lot of stars, but there is quite a lot of mass here nevertheless, usually through the presence of different types of gas, and potentially a lot of other massive objects as well, maybe black holes, maybe something else. But the strangest thing about UDGs is how different they are even within this class itself. Some of them seem to possess ridiculous amounts of mass. A good example here is the galaxy you see on the screen known as Dragonfly 44. Its mass is huge. It's essentially just a little bit less massive than our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Once again determined by measuring various global clusters. But its luminosity and overall look, I guess, is very similar to those other galaxies I showed you that don't have any dark matter. And their mass is ridiculously small in comparison. So in this sense, it doesn't really make sense how some of these galaxies have huge amounts of dark matter, almost entirely made out of it as a matter of fact, and some galaxies seem to have none. And looks like, in this paper, the scientists might have found one good explanation with visual confirmation of what they're actually looking at. So what exactly is this and what does all of this mean? In this new paper, the astronomers realized that there seems to be some kind of a line of at least 11 different ultra-diffuse galaxies that don't actually contain any dark matter in them. And all of them might have been created in a very similar way. They were probably formed as a result of some kind of a massive collision between two different galaxies. One of them is that bigger galaxy known as NGC 1052, a relatively large elliptical galaxy located in the vicinity of the two smaller ones, and some kind of a smaller progenitor galaxy which could have actually become the remnant known as DF7, with the more exact steps defined in these images. So here we have two different galaxies with both dark matter and gas in them, the galaxies that upon their collision start to intermix, with some of the matter including old stars and old global clusters being thrown out to the outskirts along with, as you can see, dark matter. And because this was a head-on collision and very high-speed collision, the dark matter and various stars would have sailed past each other, 
without any star interaction or collision, with the gas and the stars eventually slowing down, becoming more compact, and eventually forming new galaxies as a result. But the new galaxies did not contain any more dark matter, because all of it was initially thrown away. And since this scenario connects the two galaxies we've discovered so far, along with potential other discoveries, and even connects them to the larger NGC 1052, at the moment this seems to be one of the better explanations out there, with all of this most likely happening approximately 8 billion years ago. But more importantly, all of this also forming other structures. Structures that could be found in future studies. At the moment this is of course a hypothesis, but by looking around this region and along this line, the future studies might be able to confirm this and more importantly discover some other unusual features we've never seen before or have never thought about, with some of these other galaxies potentially being some of the initial targets for the investigation. And so because at the moment there seem to be at least 3 to maybe even 7 dark matter free galaxies along this particular line, with two very strange faint galaxies at the end of the line as well, which as this image shows could be the actual dark matter and remaining material from the original collision, at the moment all of this presents a really really interesting scenario that definitely has to be confirmed that could actually provide us with a really good explanation for everything. And because both DF2 and DF4 galaxies are also relatively stable and also seem to be very different from other dark matter free galaxies which most likely were created relatively recently, and most likely because of the interaction with much more massive neighbor, at the moment a collision 8 billion years ago is really the only possible and feasible explanation here. And naturally, if all of this is correct, it can also help scientists figure out how exactly dark matter behaves when galaxies collide, once again possibly even help scientists to figure out what dark matter actually is by looking at those two individual galaxies on the outskirts, and could also answer a lot of other questions in regards to various galactic collisions and what happens to various material in those galaxies when two galaxies collide at high speeds head on. Although at the moment it really only explains the formation of these two unusual galaxies DF2 and DF4, not really other galaxies we've discovered that don't possess dark matter in them, there are still some other ones which are unexplained even today. But it will probably take some time, possibly a few months, maybe even a few years, before the scientists can confirm and, well most importantly calculate, the distances and the masses to all of these galaxies observed in this picture, and thus establish what's actually happening here and if the hypothesis is correct. It is a very exciting explanation, but it could be also completely wrong. For example, if a lot of these galaxies are not on the same line, and if they're actually much closer or much farther away from us, this kind of invalidates this entire explanation. But because this is the best explanation we have so far, I'm actually kind of excited to talk about this in some of the future videos as the new studies come out and as new explanations become available. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.